Thank you very much. Uh, so, let's talk about uh, me. If you don't know me, I am a control automation engineer. I have a PhD in systems and control. Uh, since 2013, I'm with the space system divisions of the National Institute for Space Research, INPI, in Brazil, where I am the mission architect and also the technical lead of the Attitude and Orbit Control Subsystem, or AOCS, of the satellite Amazonia 1. In Julia community, I'm also the developer of some packages like satellite to box, reference frame rotations, spread tables, terminal pages, and some others. This is a little bit different presentation because I'm not here to speak, uh, to talk about a package or an algorithm or, or something. I'm here to show how we are using Julia to solve a problem, which is how to develop attitude control subsystems for satellites. This is what I'm planning. I'm, I'm going to talk how, what we did until so far and what we plan to do next. But first, let's uh, talk about Amazonia 1. What, what is Amazonia 1? Amazonia 1 was the first remote sensing satellite fully integrated in design in Brazil. This is, was the project that started it all. It was launched successfully on February 28, uh, February to, to 2021, two years ago. And Julia was a key technology during the AOCS development. Here is a picture during the, oh, my mouse, where is? No, that is a picture of the satellite during some tests, and my last picture with it in India before the launch. But before starting, let's talk about what is attitude control. Attitude is not altitude, I did not misspell this word. It's just the orientation of an object in space. So if I take my cell phone and move it like it, I'm changing its attitude. This is attitude. So what is attitude control? For this, I, I'd like to show a real footage. This was obtained during the injection process of the Amazonia 1. The satellite is uh, uh, exiting the launcher, and then it starts to do the things, open the solar panels, and then you see it's changing its orientation to point the solar panels, the solar panels towards the sun. This is attitude control. I'm changing the orientation of the satellite to accomplish some tasks. But why do I need to do that? Mostly of satellites have some payload, and you have, and you have to point this payload towards something to acquire your data. For example, Hubble needs to point the lenses to, a, I don't know, a, a star or something to get this image. But how do I do this? How can I control the attitude of satellite? The first thing you need to do is to measure the attitude. You have to measure it. And for this, you have many sensors. Some sensors, magnetometers, star trackers, gyros, and so on. And also, you have to change the attitude. So you need actuators, like reaction wheels, magnet torque rods, and thrusters. Well, this is what was attitude control 101. Uh, but now, let's see how we develop attitude control and how Julia is helping us to do so. First of all, you might imagine that it is almost impossible to replicate on ground the space dynamics for a rigid body. You cannot try to, for example, levitate the satellite and remove all the perturbations so that you have the same dynamics. It's, it's impossible. There, there are some academic works trying to achieve that, but it's very difficult to, I don't know, levitate a 700 kilo satellite so simulations are essential. We need simulations from the design phase up to acceptance status. And the results of those simulations are what we use to uh, go, to do the go, go. The system is okay, we can launch. For example, this was one, we, this is a laboratory in Brazil. Inside that chamber, uh, we have Amazonia 1. In one of the final tests, we are, doing some kind of thermocycling in vacuum. And if you look, I, I cannot move my mouse, but if you, sorry, the live footage, I'm just step up. Uh, if you look the, here, you can see many computers. Those computers are simulating the environment. Those computers are simulating the sensors uh, and sending those messages to satellite that it's working just like it will be on orbit. So we have a, satellite in the loop simulation here. And this is what we use to validate the system. Okay, but 
given that, uh, 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 sorry, given, given that we need a validated simulator, we decided inside this project to create one simulator to test many things. Amazonia 1 was the first mission that we was built in, in, on top of what we call the PMM, a Portuguese acronym for the Multi-Mission Platform. It's a platform that you can use for many missions. So we decided to develop this high-fidelity AUCS simulator to verify problematic scenarios. Um, this was the project that led me to create reference frame rotations in satellite to box. And we used the differential equation from CIML uh, uh, ecosystem as the, the thing that glued everything together. Uh, th this is a huge project. We are simulating each sensor I, sh I showed to you, each actuator, the orbit dynamics, um, perturbations, and whatever. If we remove the differential equations, of course, we have 40,000 lines of code. It's a, it's a very big project. We use this inside the, the, this project to make a, a very big analysis for all the possible errors we, can fi we could find during the launch. We simulated 35 billion minutes. We could do this because it is very fast. It's really fast. So we find problematic scenarios. We find situations that if it happens on orbit, we have to act very fast to save the missions. So we were very well prepared. How does it work? You have these continuous sets of variables, opt propagation, sun position, magnetic field simulations. And then you have this it's very interesting thing called callbacks in the differential equations where you just stop the, the integration, run some things, and changes. Which is, just happens to be exactly how the satellite works. Inside the satellite, we have a computer that works in definite steps and executes the, 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 the things that it must execute. So this is what we did to simulate the systems. And just to show how it works, uh, just a simple interface where you have the initial conditions, you can put any kind of variable you want there, and it executes. I'm, I'm doing here, I think, 12 hours of simulations in this laptop here, nothing fancy, in 15 seconds. So it, it's really very fast. It's really very fast. And we are propagating orbit, computing perturbations. So, but I don't need just to be fast. It must be accurate. And we use Amazonia 1 to validate the simulator because we need, at INPI, we need to validate the simulator for the, the, the future missions. In this case, we obtained the very first uh, uh, telemetry frame from the satellite, so the satellite was launched and communicate with the ground. We take the very first telemetry frame, obtain the initial state, and input to the simulator. On that figure, the orange curve is what the simulator said, oh, Amazonia 1 will do this. And the blue curve is what the Amazonia 1 really did. It is the total angular momentum on the reaction wheel set. There is a lot of curves besides that. You can see the match is almost perfect. We cannot have a perfect match because the, the, the initial state was obtained from sensors and the sensor has errors. But it's a very good one. So we can say that the simulator is validated by looking the, this picture. But we went further. When you assemble a sensor or something on the satellite, you always have errors. You cannot assemble a gyro or, or a Star Trek perfectly. It will have misalignments, for example. For some missions, and Amazonia 1 is one of these, we must calibrate those sensors on orbit. We have to realign and change some uh, internal properties uh, in the software. So we use the same simulator to validate the algorithms that we apply to calibrate the Amazonia 1 sensors of the attitude and orbit control subsystems. When everything was done, we start to get in those kind of pictures. This is from South Florida. You can see this is a very sharp image. We can see roads. We can see a boat up there, all those structures. The only way to obtain a figure so sharp is if everything is working and the attitude and orbit control subsystems is one of those parts. It's more or less like this. If I try to take a picture of you shaking my hand, it will be blurry. The same thing happens uh, up there, but it's much harder because the subject is 700 kilometers away. 
So, given this picture, given the, the, the results I show, we now we are confident to say that our simulator are 100% validated. But then we reach what I, what I call the N simulator problem. To develop the NOCS, you have to go through many steps. I list just some of them here. For example, when we are designing the control loop games, I need to have a simple rigid body simulator and a simple reaction wheel simulator to design my control games. If I want to design the attitude estimator, I have also to uh, implement some kind of rigid body simulator, and I have to simulate all the sensors. If I want to design the orbit estimator, of course I have to code some orbit simulator, and also the GPS simulator. If I want to turn the reaction wheels, I need the reaction wheel simulator. In, when, I have to, when I'm testing the entire system, as I showed in that picture, I have to, I, full, I, I must implement a full simulator. Do you realize how many times I said the word simulator here? So, this is the end simulator problem. At each phase, one special, one engineer codes a simulator to solve the problem. And it, normally it's even in different languages. For example, the control engineer likes MATLAB very much, more than I want. Uh, and so the code is in MATLAB. I, we cannot just take it through the other phase until the implementation in C++. Uh, and the, big, the biggest problem here is that we don't have uh, means to perform a, uh, how can I, a test phase by phase because the result of one phase cannot be just uh, compared to the next one because the assumptions in the simulator are different. So this is a big problem. Uh, how do you solve today? Uh, we wait for the last phase where we have this hardware in the loop test with validator simulator. If something goes wrong, okay, uh, let's redo the software. But it costs a lot. The simulator on that phase happens in real time. Uh, if we find some error in the software, we have to go back, emit a new, a new version of software, and go to in pass the entire validation campaign again to test for, re for regressions, so it costs a lot. Hence, we, INPE in Brazil, uh, it's the National Institute for Space Research. We are a research institute, so we are always looking how to improve things. And now that Amazon is working well, we are trying to see what we can fix, what we can improve in terms of the AOCS. And today I'm going to talk about how this end simulator problem is being solved. Okay. This is the previous, previous picture, how the simulator works today. By looking at that uh, uh, picture, I, I was uh, staring at and I see, well, this is the computer digital logic. All the algorithm, all the OCS happens there. The continuous variables are things that do, does not change. The geomagnetic field does not change if you change your emission. The orbit propagation does not change if you change your emission. So, if you remove this and design a good interface using the same callback structure of uh, differential equations. We can, for example, plug a high-level software written Julia to control the satellite attitude. We can plug the embedded software, the C++ software that we run on the satellite. We can plug the processor simulator. Processor here is the satellite onboard processor, which is completely different from, from what we have here. We can even plug the hardware in the loop simulator with the satellite assembled. How does, uh, just a, 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 I'll try to show in a very simple way, how does it work? The first thing you have to do is to update the dynamics. Do one step in the ODE. Then you create some kind of sensor messages that complies with the interface we developed. From the other side, we have the AOC software, the attitude and orbit control software, which can be everything, anything. We can have the, the entire satellite AOC software, or we can have just one small function to test one part. But it must decode the sensor message to obtain the, the, the state of the satellite. It iterates the control algorithm, do whatever it needs to do. It then creates the actuator message complying with that interface. And then the simulator decode those actuator messages, update the states of the actuators, and propagate the loop, and the things goes on forever. What 
given this kind of, uh, of, of interface and design, we developed a four-stage process to create algorithms for the attitude and con orbit control for the satellite. On the very first stage, we have algorithms developed entirely in Julia. So you, you have, for example, the sun determination algorithm, a part of it. It's written 100% in Julia. This is the stage where Julia really shines because if we are coding in other language, say, for example, Python, th this stage will be very slow because the entire software will be written in Python, not in C++. In Python, if you don't uh, translate to C++, it usually is slow. In Julia, we can have the entire, and we have now, the entire uh, uh, embedded software code in Julia with excellent, uh, with uh, very fast speed. Uh, so, in this first stage, we can do Monte Carlo simulations. We can obtain a lot of uh, test results to validate the, the other stages. And, we, of course, since Julia is dynamic, a dynamic language, it's very easy to debug, it's very easy to change things. And we spend some time on this process. When we are happy, oh, this is a good algorithm. To test this algorithm, we have to, for example, I, I, uh, I select some kinds of initial states, and those initial states provide this kind of results. These are the test results we, we need to see on the other stages. And then I take this code, Julia code, and pass to a programmer. We translate it to C++. And using this amazing package called CXX wrap, we can integrate the code following that interface with the Julia simulator. But what is very interesting here is that this code is the same code that the satellite computer run is without change a single call. So here we can test again with Monte Carlo simulations, looking all those uh, initial states and see if the results are correct, we can spot bugs and whatever, with the very same software we will use in the, in the embedded computer. In the third stage, we went a little bit further. We take the, the, the software and execute it inside the processor simulator. Because here, we can, uh, we can analyze if the memory consumption is okay. We have a very limited memory inside uh, computer uh, for space applications. We can see if the computational burden is okay, and among other things. Up to this stage, all the, develop all, all the development happens within the OCS team, which is very important because uh, nowadays the satellite normally has only one computer. And inside this computer you have everything. You have thermal control, you have data handling, you have the OCS, and, and other. And people will not buy a lot of satellite computers for those teams to make the development. So it's important to reduce as much as possible the usage of this flight hardware. Using this process, we can reach the third stage where we have the final AOCS code without requiring any external uh, uh, computer or, or, or simulator uh, of the real satellite computer. And also, up to this stage, all the simulations does not occur in real time. One second of simulation is not one second in real life. So we can execute very long simulations that last days, weeks, without problem. And in the last stage, we take this code, pass to the, to the computer team, which integrates inside the, code, the satellite embedded operation system and executes a hardware in the loop simulation. It is working right now. Here is a, 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 our test laboratory lab in Brazil. On the right, on the right, you have the satellite computer connected through that hack to the simulation computers here. The three from the left to the right, no, sorry, from the right to the left, the three are just computers to interface with the satellite computer, and this one is the Julia, the, the same simulator I, I, I've just shown here, running, uh, closing the loop of everything. What is very interesting here, very important, is that since all the phases share the same simulator, it's very easy to compare the results because uh, it must be the same. So the 
all the errors can be spotted much earlier. Currently, we have 50% of this next generation AOCS software uh, in C++. And we, deliver, and we achieved this, 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 this uh, value with a huge gain in time. Nobody anticipated that we will be so fast to, to, to reach this point. And up to now, not a single error was identified during this final stage test here. All the errors were obtained on those three first stages. And when we run the simulation here, we always got it in the first time. So, sorry for the ugly picture. It's the only one I could show for you, but I will try to explain what it means. Uh, to the right, we have the, the first stage. We have the solution. It, this is a, a variable related to the reaction wheels. We have four reaction wheels, so four curves. Uh, to, so the first stage in the right is the result from that 100% Julia simulation that we obtained in the very beginning of the development. So uh, we know that with a set of initial conditions, we must see this kind of result. Uh, the x axis is time in seconds, so it is almost eight, more, more than eight hours. And in the left, we have the hardware in the loop simulation. The computer of the satellite is running the C++ code with the operational system of the satellite, with simulations, uh, whatever, just like uh, I showed before. And it's very easy to see that things is working because the one curve is just equal to the other. Uh, we have better uh, uh, plots here, but when I plot using the same system of the right, the plot was just equal. I will show here, you'll say, oh, you were lying. <laughs> you just copied the, the, the plot. But it's, uh, it's, this is what we saw. And this is working. The problem here, uh, suppose that we spot some error here, that the, the curve was completely different. Then we have to fix it and execute this test again. But on the fourth stage, things happen in real time. The satellite computer are executing real time. So this took eight hours to obtain. And if we want to go again, it's another eight hours. It, and it is just one test of the entire validation campaign. So it costs a lot to fix errors in this last stage. That's why we are gaining so much time. OK, so to wrap up. Julia language and its ecosystem are allowing us to build the next generation LCS software with considerable gains in development time and cost. I think uh, maybe I, uh, you know now how we are solving the any simulator problem because with that interface and that system, for example, the control engineer who likes MATLAB a lot can just go to that simulator, change the gains, and see how it, it works. He, do, he, he, don't, he doesn't need anymore to develop a simple simulator or something. He can use the real stuff. Next step. Next step is to continue advancing this kind of integrations. Up to the instance, we have the entire satellite with a closed loop simulation using the same simulator, which will perform the final validation test before the launch of our next project. And in the future, I'm really trying to do this. I have some projects in mind. Uh, maybe we can embed Julia code itself inside the satellite. If we can reach this point, then many of those stages will be gone because we, know we will not need to translate Julia code to C++. So, conclusion. We are using Julia to solve the simulator problem, and I really hope that Julia uh, help me to solve the true language problems in satellite engineering, which we, today we cannot uh, solve. Okay, thank you very much. I'm open to questions.
Okay, for, for, the, last, uh, for, for the first question, uh, no, we don't have. This is the problem. That's why we, have to, we must have a validated simulator. There's nothing else you can do. If you flip a sign here, this, you won't discover it up there. So no, we don't have any other additional method. And for the second question, I, if you look the results, there is uh, things you want in Julia from the developer survey. I am one of the vote small binaries because this is required for, for this kind of, of task. Uh, we, we can avoid the locations. The entire software written in Julia does not allocate. We can avoid garbage collection. We can avoid everything, but we do not have small binaries yet. That's the, the problem. With small binary, we can embed the Linux, sys in Linux system running this, and I think we will be fine. Thank you. Um, one of the slides, and I can just kind of describe it, you uh, kind of described that the state of the actuators and the actuators themselves are in the sim simulation. Um, yeah. Um, well, that works too. Um, so the actuators are in the simulation. Um, if you had a situation where you wanted to put your actuators in a hardware in the loop simulation, how would you, um, that's one of the difficulties that we kind of had because we have kind of like a similar setup and you have that message passing interface, but that part is like a fundamental part of your simulation. So how would you kind of handle that with this? This, this is a very nice question. Uh, and we have two modes. The first one is entirely simulated. Then, the, for example, the reaction wheel is simulated inside the, the simulator, and we are communicating. And we have a second version, where the reaction wheel is plugged into the computer. The computer uh, command the reaction wheel, read the state of the reaction wheel, and send to the simulator its states. Because, for example, for the dynamics, uh, the, the, the system only needs to know the angular momentum in the reaction wheel. So if I get this from the computer telemetry, I can close the loop with this, the actuator in the loop or entirely simulate. We have these two modes. It's possible. But uh, magnet, uh, magnet torque rod is not that interesting because it's just a current. So you send to both, uh, to the simulator and to the, the actuator. But the reaction wheel is more a bit complicated and we do this by reading the telemetry and feeding the simulator. A very quick final question, maybe? Is that quick? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so only one question. Um, uh, to me, another advantage that you can possibly gain with using Julia for something like this is that uh, maybe you can exploit some of the things, for example, in your talk uh, yesterday about hybrid modeling, since you're talking about attitude control. Uh, so I was wondering if you considered um, employing these techniques uh, to fine-tune your models. Uh, hybrid modeling ones using the Julia ecosystem. Okay. Yeah, let's thank Ronan again for a very nice talk. Start, uh, and I'll I will take it. Yeah. Oh, you will introduce yourself. Uh, so I'll be talking. So. Oh, okay. I can introduce us as well. Okay, sounds good. I mean, if you want. Okay. That's, uh, that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you plan it with questions and like five minutes allocated for questions, or do you want to take the full 30 minutes for like talking? Like five or seven minutes for questions. Okay, so I will yeah. show you numbers, and th those numbers will refer to five minutes till the end, so you have okay. five minutes. Okay. And yeah. Okay. And then for the Q&A portion, if you want to stay at the podium, okay. you can yeah. use this mic yeah. and then they can pass around. Okay. Thank you. All you got to do is, once the Q&A portion, just push the button, it'll turn green, it'll be on, it works just fine. Okay. Okay. Okay.
na zapomenúť na Q&A, zapnúť mikrofón. Hello everybody, I'm Otto uh, and I'm here with the whole uh, group that's behind DIVE, the framework for value dynamics. So Jan, he will uh, continue in the talk and Sean and Tenchi. We call ourselves uh, decision science. We are part of a, a data science department aligned with Merck Research Laboratories. And we have a big vision to make a big change in a big company. Make uh, Merck uh, invents and produces medicines for human and animal use. And it's a very high stakes a gamble that you have to brace yourself for spending over $10 billion over 10 years of time and having a failure rate around 95%. So most of the projects fail in the biology research or chemistry or pharmacology or they are not efficient enough or for other strategic reasons. So it's a zoo and the whole process of discovering and developing new medicines is very complex because of the variety, uh, dynamicity, all kinds of uncertainties, also because of human decision makers who are not really well um, coordinated and, and because of outside factors. So what we want is to improve the, the productivity of, of R&D uh, productively and for that we use scientific machine learning obviously uh, Julia and we have to deal with a large variety of processes at, at many scales starting from the molecular uh, over research processes clinical trials manufacturing up to uh, public health and for that, we've chosen a, a small number of key abstractions that, that we use and, and augment and integrate. So that would be chemical reactions or generalized chemical reactions as petri nets and notably open petri nets, but we also, um, let's see, extend them, we allow for non-integer coefficients, we allow for delays, we allow for capacity constraints on the transitions, callbacks, of course, on the production side, uh, you can produce actions that are like small scripts that rewrite the state, and the state, microstate and macrostates, can be anything representable uh, in a computer. And the resources, so that generalize the chemical species, the resources may be uh, physical, like biological material or, or chemical material. They can be, it can be human labor, it can be information, it can be money, uh, it can be contracts. Um, and uh, to get a better view, we represent things hierarchically for that uh, the resource and, and process algebra of, of operats or the, the well, applied category theory is, is again a great uh, abstraction for us, but we also use uh, data structures and, and functions from uh, algebraic Julia, the computational applied category theory ecosystem. And when we simulate, we mostly, this is 
mostly but not exclusively metaprogramming that from a high level specification language dive we generate uh, problem specifications in differential equations the JL is discrete problems but we can then co well simulate or co integrate those with problems in differential equations proper or agents do JL or uh, algebraic dy dynamics and uh, to well not to disclose any trade secrets but uh, we've we had to apply this we cannot we developed the the framework three uh, packages or uh, open source on, on Julia GitHub and the force is uh, in the process of being put there and the two key are reactive dynamics that's the uh, chemical network generalization and algebraic agents where you can have a hierarchy of spaces and agency and they are coordinated and, and you can also link the two together and orchestrate co-integration with external things. So the three applications in-house, one was in systems pharmacology. So this is all about dynamics on networks of relationships and, and values. And uh, at the finest granularity, uh, the network was a network of reactions and relationships between molecules in the brain and the decision variables were about thousand variables uh, uh, when you would be adding some combination of candidate drugs and you look to maximize the effect but minimize the overall dose. With the same approach and uh, tool stack, we also optimize networks of, well, or experimental design in preclinical where you uh, have a good biological and chemical hypothesis, how you want to do something in, in the body, but before you can try doing that in even healthy volunteers in clinical trials, you have to do a battery of different tests in preclinical. They can be in silico, in vitro, in vivo, and it's a big uh, network. And we help the projects navigate the network by choosing the next best experiment, which would uh, decrease uncertainty about key questions in preclinical, but also would save time and money. So of the local value uh, surrogates like speed, quality, cost, capacity, we add also uh, information gain. And, and as we can integrate models algebraically, uh, we can also have generative models that are coherent because they represent a joint distribution over many things at different scales and that would increase the coherence of uh, decisions. So, and I didn't mention the third application in supply chain optimization. So when you plan for a new clinical trial, you have to make sure that you manufacture in time enough of the new substance and you distribute it. It can be to a large number of countries globally and some of the distribution chains have to be cold if, if these are vaccines, for example, and controlled and so on. So this is just to illustrate that we can uh, and do apply the, the approach at different scales. Yeah. Okay, I will skip the large process model, which was uh, really a synthetic. It was not an application for Merck. Uh, research labs, but just to show that we could build a synthetic model of the whole life cycle of the whole company 
and with the hope that if anybody wants to use it for real, they would just focus on a domain and replace the synthetic input data with their own data and with a code less or uh, code free approach they would have a digital twin of their domain so i invite jan to continue in the detail and all the develop most of the development well everyone I am, uh, yeah, I'm Jan, I'm a research scientist in Autosteam, and I've been the main developer of uh, the three packages and some other packages which are <laughs> due to be published very soon for over the uh, last three years. And, uh, well, uh, as we heard, our credo is to uh, approach uh, the task of process modeling uh, productively. And uh, to achieve this goal, uh, it has been a long-standing uh, challenge for us to properly define um, a framework of the process models that would be uh, able to capture a wide range of the of the of different processes uh, that um, occur in science or in business, and at the same time, I'd like to keep this uh, framework uh, manageable and tamed so that it could be really. <laughs> um, um, maintained and uh, people could onboard uh, this framework um, quickly. So, uh, um, of course, uh, the key idea is that uh, many different problems can be tackled using uh, some um, very specific packages. So, for example, how to, to model the chemical, uh, the chemical reactions, you can use Catalyst, or there are some, uh, you can use agents for some agent based modeling. But we would like to provide some or define some framework which is able to well to accommodate all or <laughs> a wide range or a broad range of these problems so that uh, the, mo the models would be interoperable and uh, we would need to spend uh, much time or trying to bind uh, these different pieces together. So this is a mm, very uh, mm, uh, well um, uh, very. Um, well, it's the main feature or the main goal that we are trying to uh, pursue. So uh, uh, the starting point for us for the framework uh, uh, was uh, in the uh, in the category of open battery net. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure that we are <laughs> familiar with this concept, but uh, you can think of this as some uh, yeah that we have some two types of objects. So we have some some agents or some entities, and we have some rules that move these uh, agents or these entities in the system yeah that that are yeah these these transitions or these rules are the driving force of the system and uh, yeah already battery nets are very powerful but of course they uh, are not able to uh, well uh, to uh, to capture all the complexity of the processes that naturally occur in uh, science and business so uh, we this generalization to part in several steps. So uh, first, we wanted to make the agents or the entities more granular. So uh, the entities can be thought of as uh, some generalized agents, which are structured, which, which have their own identity. And then the transitions uh, or the rules that move these agents these entities uh, can have some further attributes. So for example, uh, uh, the duration of the transition or some uh, maximum um, number of, of the transitions uh, occurring in some time unit or some cost uh, which is uh, uh, incurred by the transition and so on. So uh, this is uh, so we really to, to be way by extending or enlarging uh, or enriching the, uh, the category of uh, battery nets. So that, that's for well, two, two, two main, um, these are two main uh, take points uh, for this. And uh, the another one is that uh, we want to make possible to, um, well, to easily compose different process models into a uh, compound process model. And uh, also, uh, and this is somehow hidden this <laughs> um, in the figure, but uh, uh, we try to uh, make it easy to, to define these networks. So uh, to this purpose, we developed uh, some domain-specific language, which can be used to, uh, to, to set up the transitions and uh, define the agents in the uh, process uh, models. So uh, <laughs> even if we have no doubt that uh, all these features are truly revolutionary, uh, the development of, of uh, 
of this package called Reactive Dynamics uh, took uh, place in uh, several evolutionary steps. So we already started uh, with with the pattern nets, where there's some yeah, um, ever transition has some uh, some say some left hand side, some right hand side. And there are tokens or entities that are moved by these transitions, and then we iteratively uh, we are iteratively adding some some attributes to the transition. So for example, the duration of the transition, some intensity of some working number of the transitions that are spawned in time, uh, um, time unit, and um, also some probabilities of the successful, uh, of, of, yeah, of the transition uh, being terminated successfully, and so on. And uh, so this is really some, some iterative process, and uh, uh, ultimately uh, we are trying to, um, well, um, to, to model even the transitions as some kind of generalized agents so that uh, a transition could occur, uh, for example, on the uh, left-hand side uh, uh, of another transition, and this would uh, open, the pay, open the way towards, say, a structured transitions or so. So the modeling process in reactive dynamics uh, takes um, uh, well, in, in several different steps. So the first step is that you have some uh, mental model of, of the of some process model of some um, you have some reactions, and you specify this or you define uh, your state this <laughs> mental model using the domain specific language of type. So this really resembles uh, the um, well um, um, the syntax of, for example, Catalyst. Or some <laughs> some uh, battery nets. So you need to provide the intensity of the transition at the left-hand side, the right-hand side, and you can also provide the, uh, the, the further attributes of the transition yeah, that's shown on the right-hand side. Then this, this information, yeah, this, this, uh, this definition uh, of, the, of the process network is stored using uh, so-called adjets. So if you are familiar with GATLAB and ACT, you will know <laughs> what I'm speaking about. But you can think of this as some, uh, as some very tricky database, uh, which allows for uh, a well, simple handling of, of uh, um, well, uh, querying uh, the data uh, which is stored in the, in the database. And then uh, uh, we take this database or the problem specification, turn this into into some problem that can be really uh, simulated or evolved. And uh, with interactive dynamics, uh, this uh, this problem is uh, uh, is a very particular problem. It's a discrete problem within differential equations package, and <laughs> this is. Um, it is very powerful because you can uh, then um, very easily do any sort of uh, um, well optimization tasks, or uh, you can perform some ensemble analysis, parameter fitting, or so. And we also uh, well to to simplify this even further, uh, we also develop some um, some macros uh, that can be used. Uh, uh, for example, just for plotting or for simulation of the system, so you don't, you don't need, or some scientist doesn't really need to do, uh, to learn uh, um, um, how to work with differential equations, but can use instead a set of, I'll say, uh, three or four uh, macro constructs, uh, which uh, well, which export most of the functionality of, uh, say, differential equations. Yep. So. I am this on the right hand side. You can see how we how we pass from from the database to the uh, differential equations problem, and then we can perform say some uh, some uh, simulation or some ensemble analysis. This is shown on this on this slide. Okay, and there's another package or <laughs> another uh, say initiative within the Dai framework. And yeah, as I mentioned, or you may <laughs> have noticed. Very often I use the word agents, so we uh, it's 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 very comfortable for us to think of the different entities, yeah, um, within the networks or the particles, uh, uh, of some of some agents, and uh, we developed a package uh, which allows you to uh, well to very efficiently uh, structure some uh, agent models. And uh, so for example, yeah, you know that for example in agents, as far as I know, uh, the agents are indexed by integers or so, and they are all say within the same flat hierarchy. But 
um, or two. Um, so this is this is great for some say some uh, particle swarms or so, but in uh, for some more practical applications, for example in science and business, it's it's very natural to to structure the agents into some hierarchies. So for example, as you can see uh, here, in the yeah, the tree somehow depicts uh, some uh, um, some hierarchy of agents. When we can, where we can uh, structure, for example, yeah, the pharma company into different areas, into different departments, and there there's some department for production, and this department has some well, some embedded agents, and something similar is, for example, for logistics and for market, and all these uh, well agents can be really, or entities can be <laughs> structured, or can be put into this single hierarchy. And uh, it's also very easy uh, to uh, um, to say uh, to query uh, this hierarchy and to, um, for example, to index different the agents in, within the hierarchy using some paths and using cross diff paths, really like in a um, Unix file system. So this is very powerful to to reference uh, the uh, different different agents within the hierarchy. And another <laughs> another feature of this package, and I would say this is really some killer application, uh, which uh, makes the application very different from, uh, say, um, the usual agent-based uh, or other packages uh, that are uh, yeah, for, for the purpose of agent-based modeling. Yeah, that we can or that we try to make possible to to co-simulate or to co-integrate different uh, kind of. Uh, um, dynamical system or the modality. So, uh, in case that you attended yesterday's lecture on uh, um, uh, neuro ODE yeah, about the FMIs, FMUs, uh, you will <laughs> this will definitely ring many bells with you. But uh, I would say that we try to well to avoid um, the complexity, the heavy machinery of MAIs, MMUs, and instead to develop some really lightweight interface that allows you to wrap different. Uh, well, dynamical systems which were defined in different modalities, for example, some, some discrete time agents or some uh, differential uh, continuous time, differential equations problem. Yeah, you can then wrap all these different kinds, kinds of problems into a single hierarchy, into a single system. And how this is done? So, uh, uh, well, uh, somehow assume that all the agents the different dynamical system within the hierarchy they share some some kind of implicit uh, global um, well, time horizon or um, yeah and uh, we make it possible for each agent to have its own evolutionary rule and also the agents somehow export the time how uh, when they awake or they uh, when they wake up and when they uh, well uh, well proceed to the next state so uh, and uh, yeah, this is, this is actually, it may <laughs> uh, seem quite complex, but uh, it's, it's very easy. And uh, it's really, if you have some, for example, some differential equations problem defined yeah, in, in the fact, it's how you just need to, to provide some um, um, wrapper function, uh, which uh, yeah, wraps the, uh, the integrator of the defect problem. And into a special, specialized a set of uh, um, common interface uh, methods, which were defined within this algebraic agents uh, uh, package. And it's even more, more simpler because we early, uh, we knew, uh, or we tried to, or we prepared uh, um, uh, some wrappers for uh, several very popular packages. For example, yeah, the differential equations for agents or for algebraic dynamics. So that if in the case that you have some say, some continuous time uh, problem defined in defect or some uh, discrete time uh, uh, agent-based model defined in agents, you can simply uh, use uh, the, the function some some uh, the provided functions which will wrap. The, uh, these different models as the algebraic agents, and then you can put these different agents into a single hierarchy, and then you can uh, co-simulate or this, well, approximate the joint evolution of the of the system. So it's very important to know that <laughs> that we don't really claim to have some uh, well to 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 be able to mm, to get the uh, exact or uh, mm, the most exact approximation of the joint uh, dynamics. Instead, we are trying to, to balance uh, the costs of developing some fine-grained model on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, 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 the, um, well, um, the accuracy of this, uh, 
of, of the resulting um, um, yeah of, of the results of the of the simulation results so and usually and <laughs> we are testing this medicine on ourselves uh, it's enough for really to uh, to to get some fast approximations uh, as far as they can be uh, developed very quickly and uh, then uh, based on the preliminary results, we can then invest into some more um, um, more granular uh, models of the dynamics. But really, we try to to, to simplify uh, the process of approximation of approximating uh, the um, the dynamical systems and putting different systems together. Yeah, because often in practice, uh, for example, as we uh, try to optimize some some process in the pharma company, there are, there are already available models, for example, for logistics, for production. And uh, the optimization takes place well separately or in some sequential manner. And we and already by trying to well to to establish some some weak links between these different models can really prove advantageous and can uh, well, open some some way towards stepping some some new value and uh, well optimizing uh, both the business and uh, research processes and this is uh, what we are doing at now the decision science group with Otto. Thank you. Do we have questions? I have a, a very pragmatic question. Um, so if folks have more technical questions, uh, perhaps that would be of more broad interest. Um, but I'm just wondering how you communicate uh, the value of these systems to folks who are less familiar with applied category theory. Um, oh, like we don't mention the category theory at all. <laughs> and we don't mention Julia too much. We started. Now there are more Julia users at Merck, but it's still a very small community. Yeah. But we use, say, we use the diagrams, and uh, we use the, the, the power and, and speed so that we can do not just well, local optimization or to have some results, but to show the big picture, to construct uh, Part of frontiers for decision problems, where you can show not what's the the best decision, but if you have say almost best, you can save a lot of resource or time and so on. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, Otto, you had mentioned um, that experiment, uh, optimal experimental design is one of your applications. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about um, what, you're, what you're doing about that. Um, yes, it's also, it's an example. So you have, let's say, a small molecule and you want to uh, establish how safe it is and, and the, say, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and, and other, uh, or whether it gets into the brain, for example. So f f for these domains, um, you can either statistically choose that you would start with experiments that uh, filter the most, that because you don't want to do a lot of stuff with compounds that you abandon eventually. So you want to filter uh, and you want to start with experiments which are fast and, and cheap and, and leave those where, say, um, in vivo uh, expensive experiments for the, uh, for, the, for the end. But you can improve on that adaptively. If you have a history of compounds, you would say uh, you can explore uh, the, the, the tree, how you would go in sequence of experiments and how you would uh, decrease the information entropy of the results using the historic data as, as a proxy for the information gain uh, 
approximation, and you would you get the bookkeeping. You know how much time and money you would spend for that. So this is a stochastic, a Markov tree search. And in this, uh, you can combine machine learning uh, and the simulation of the projects as petrinets that you would, uh, the callback would call the machine learning uh, piece, the Bayesian dynamic programming algorithm to recommend the next best experiment. You go there using the dynamics and you can also simulate the context, other projects uh, competing for your resources. And then based on the outcome of the experiment which you get from the real world, uh, you then condition the other learning. So it is very well adaptive, customized for your project. If, if that is an answer to your question. But you can use it, for example, for uh, patients in ER where the experiments would be uh, diagnoses. And yeah. Hey, Otto, uh, one quick hey. question here. Um, yeah, so normally when I've seen it in the, uh, in the QSP context and such, right, a lot of people are doing the ODE models. I haven't seen too much use of the, the Gillespie processes and the, and the discrete time processes. I'm wondering if you could describe how much that's, that's uh, used within Merck and you know, what, what kinds of things the stochastic modeling is, is in, uh, interesting for. Um, well, we are not pharmacologists, even though Tenchi has <laughs> most of, well, yeah, he would be, but he joined only uh, earlier this year. And so we, made the jump from systems biology from using uh, petri nets and the, the uh, OD models to represent the pathways in R&D where you consume, well, you don't uh, take chemical species, but you consume human labor, money, and material, and, and so on. And there um, you would have statistics say, for a project of this type in, at this stage, what is uh, say the duration and attrition rate and cost and so on. So this is where you get the stochasticity. Let's thank all our speakers from this session again.
Yes. So this takes HDMI. I just want to see how easy it is. To and do uh, why do people have to use the microphone? They, they can use this. Why do people use the microphone? Uh, just because people tend to when they're giving presentations, even if they're not trying to, oh, walking sway around. back and forth. And this doesn't really pick people up very well unless you're kind of right on top of it. So. Okay. See. Yeah, do you also don't see what your You don't have a laser pointer, right? To use it? Uh that could oh, be one, the middle button. Oh okay. 
Perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to see one thing. Stay in a small area just for the camera. <laughs> but if you know, maybe at some point because the press, funny part is that the you want to do a quick sprint around the room, we're not going to stop. Okay. 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 Thank.
Hey there. Good to know. Good, thank you. Uh, so, do you need a dongle for the HDMI cable? Yeah, uh, yeah. I need to go. Uh, I guess you have one here. No? Uh, I've got one over here that I prefer to use. Sounds good. Uh, Regular HMI, I have a dongle as well. Yeah. So, is, wait, so, are the dongles provided or do you have one? Okay. I can use. That's yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let me answer that. Okay. I think that should be fine. Go ahead. Um, yep. If I remove this, I guess. We'll use this. Are you ready to plug in? Let's give it a try. Okay. It's a USB-C dongle, right? Correct. Just one. Just takes a second. Okay. Cool. And uh, yeah, the rest should be fine. I'm just, uh, I mean, I don't know that there's a reason uh, to uh, fail. So yeah. what we've been doing for the talks this morning yeah. is just using that handheld right there. Um, so what I'll do is I'll turn it on now and then mute it. Because usually we have control, but I don't have control back there. So you can see this button right here that says mute. If you press it, it goes green, then okay. it's on. I'll leave it for you like this, okay. muted. If people have questions at the end, we usually use this to pass around. What you can do is if you want to stay up here so they can keep this out there in the questions, you press this, it goes green. I can also just kind of leave it on. And then you can just use this mic to answer questions. For questions? Yep. Okay. But so otherwise, presentation. I this for questions. I Sounds good. Bring that to the, to the audience. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. How, how do I turn it on? Uh, it'll be turned on already. Okay. Let me get my little offset. Okay. Ready to go. okay. But of course, just like. Uh, okay. So, can you take it? Um, are you doing an intro? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so it's muted. Yeah. So it's orange. Just click this button. Click
Oh, I see. Cool. That'd be great. Uh, it doesn't plug in, but hopefully I have a half hour of power on you. <laughs> Just so you have to hurry up? <laughs> yeah, I should work out. Yeah. Um, but we can also ask the... Just there's a faulty contact on this thing. But it, it isn't turned on, is it? It is actually, but... No. Oh, it gets off. Sorry, can you... Help the book? It's okay? I will find out, but... Uh, <laughs> If I run in trouble, I will. If we have a guy here that's familiar with all that stuff, then we will. No, it's just it's fudgy. No, the thing is, uh, is glitchy. It's my it's my plug that's <coughs> it's not working very well. Yeah, it, it is, but uh, like I said, it's it's my plug that's actually bad. Oh, my okay. power plug. I'll be fine. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for the trouble. So thank you and welcome to this CIMR session. We have six interesting talks. My name is Lars Mikkelsons. I'm from the University of Augsburg. And our first talk will be by Mr. Gael Forge, <laughs> is the right pronunciation, from the MIT. And uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. I think I need to take this microphone. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Um, all right. So today I'm going to tell you about this project of mine that I call Digital Twins for Ocean Robots. Um, and it's sort of one of my more sort of extensive uh, projects with Julia yet. Um, involves a lot of packages, so I'll get to that. But I will start by just introducing the concept and the motivation for this work. Um, essentially, it's going to be about, you know, using real observations, accessing them, leveraging them, and then simulating them on, on a computer using Julia, um, and interacting with all of this. Um, so that's the way I've brought up the, the plantation. 
what are digital twins? It's a phrase that's used in a lot of different contexts, and everybody has kind of their own definitions. So just for the record, this is the one I'm going to use today. Um, so a digital twin is going to be a pairing. Um, it's going to be a computer representation of real systems and an interaction uh, that we can interact with. Um, and there's, you know, built in, there must be a two-way connection framework between the real system and the virtual one. Uh, the goal being to enable mutual benefits, typically. Um, in my, my presentation and this work, the, the real system is both the climate system being you know, wound up by us um, and the observing system that goes on top of it. So that's the real system. So I want to reproduce all of that in a virtual world, meaning I want to start from a model of climate scenarios propagate that all the way through in the oceans, in my case, to see what happens on the marine ecosystems and generate virtual observations of this. So this is for the setting of the stage. Um, like I said, there are reasons we do this, and typically there are these mutual benefits between observations and, and modeling. Uh, so I've given you a list here. It's not meant to be ex ex you know, um, exhaustive. <clears throat> but the first one is probably what comes to mind most immediately, data simulation, machine learning, and, and training models with data that fits naturally in this sort of framework. Um, more simply, scientific interpretation of data, you need models and vice versa. Um, one of the things that we want to do with this sort of framework that I'm going to talk about is also think about you know, optimizing an observational strategy for you know, looking at the climate system. So this is a, you know, a, a feedback and a, a learning about the way that we should deploy observations. Uh, we want to do this for a range of climate scenarios so that we know that our monitoring system is adequate for that, regardless of what happens. Um, and there's applications to the line of you know, active controls of um, robots when they are at sea as well. So this is more kind of um, in real time um, in the field type of thing, uh, where we also want to be able to provide kind of an augmented reality from the model to the data. So a, lo a, lot list, uh, a long list of things we can do with this sort of things. Um, here's kind of my one slide to represent data simulation um, or machine learning. You create a scenario with a perturbed climate in this case. You're looking at maps of ocean circulations. Um, generate a system, um, like simulate an observing system for that. Apply a uh, estimation workflow of some sort. In my case, this is adjoint-based um, curve fitting of a, a general circulation model to data, and then evaluate the performance. Right? So what you're seeing on the right-hand side is a decrease of error due to the data simulation, where we show that the data is going to improve uh, the estimates of the real ocean. So doing this in a virtual world is nice because we know what the truth actually is, so we can actually qualify the results and prove that it may work in reality. So that's why we want to do this sort of things in a twin world. Um, and this is also an opportunity to say that one of the reasons I think Julia is great for all this sort of work is that there is a rich ecosystem of very powerful methods to the, you know, um, from Bayesian estimation to, <clears throat> to neural networks to all sorts of uh, Kalman filtering and, and, and so on. So um, this is what we will leverage ultimately. Another piece of motivation for me doing this work is climate change. So just looking at these two plots, you see on the left uh, the way that the climate uh, has been warming up. This is from satellite data, right? Uh, not an ocean robot, but a space robot in this case. Um, and on the right-hand side is the projection in the future, um, the time scale being quite a bit longer. And so we want to sort of look at those two things combined. Uh, but the urgency to do this sort of work really comes from we have a huge problem on our hands the planet is burning up. You've, you've heard the news this summer, um, and we need to we need to be good about you know monitoring it, doing the best job we can to do that, and detect the issues that propagate through the system. A third thing that brought me to this is a workshop I did last year with uh, folks that were more involved with ocean robots themselves, and so this was the uh, 2022 symposium on advances in ocean observations. The goal was to bring uh, together a small group of um, experts um, focusing on smarter methods of ocean observation and with the aim to generate ideas across science and technology and advance observation in novel ways. 
And so what I came up with is, well, let's do this in Julia. Here is a framework that you can use to um, evaluate, demonstrate your new concepts of observation and, and make the case that they are going to help us and so on. And so in a way, you know, it's this meeting last year that really motivated me in putting my thoughts into this. Um, and I look forward to working with these great folks. Right. So we're going to talk about ocean robots, real ones, and simulated ones. So, real ocean robots, what are they? Um, well, I wrote this little package called Ocean Robots GL, um, partly to access the data and then to build this project forward. Um, what you will find in this package is a set of uh, notebooks that are all listed here, most of them, uh, that access different kind of data sets. And so, based on this work, now we now have a bridge between all of this data and Julia, essentially. Um, and they're in the form of notebooks because I care very much about the interactivity. I'll show you a few examples to make things more concrete. Uh, the first thing you might wonder about is what's the state of the observing system, the monitoring system today, and so there are uh, tools for that. Um, and specifically, we can query databases that have all of the metadata of what's going on. And so this is what this notebook does. And it shows in the different colors, different kind of, uh, of instruments, uh, which I will tell you a little bit more about later. Um, you see that it's fairly complex. There's a lot of different um, colors and, and things that are deployed. Uh, it's a huge amount of investment, of course. This is some, you know, a global effort to observe the climate system. So this is sort of the, the big picture. And then if we zoom in a bit, we're going to have different types of ocean robots. Here is one that maybe um, is the simplest to understand. It's uh, just a, a instrument that is anchored to the bottom and has a bunch of instruments on it, um, measuring, measuring devices. Uh, so you have a picture on the left. Uh, this is data sets from um, the, the NOAA. Um, and you see on this um, a bunch of things at the top, which are like little sensors, and you see people maintaining this thing. Um, so the notebook on the right, which is from the Ocean Robots GL collection, uh, gets this data set, and it's got 25 year time series of temperature that I'm looking at, and just computes a little histogram of how much uh, the ocean has warmed up over a 25 year period, and that would be the histogram that's in the top left here. Um, so this is something you can you know, pick whatever uh, buoy around the US, and they are deployed uh, around our coastline, and get this sort of information right away uh, through this notebook. So I'd, I'd say this is a stationary robot, uh, in a way. We have other things like this one. Uh, here the picture on the left should suggest to you that this is a little smaller. It's a little device that people can just uh, throw off of the, of the ship. And these guys, um, these drifting robots, they are very important in measuring ocean currents. Um, they have um, they've been deployed globally, and so the typical information we get from them is what's in the, in the middle panel, uh, where you see this uh, pattern of, of um, motion. Um, this is a longitude latitude plan, um, where we follow the trajectory of this uh, robot. So this is the type of things that we're going to try and simulate, the trajectory of these things, when they're exposed to a set of flow fields in the ocean, the ocean currents, and could be also in the atmosphere, in fact. Um, so drifting robots. And then just one step further, we have um, this set of so-called drifting profilers or profiling floats, uh, which have already become the, the backbone of our observing of climate uh, today. And so this is one that uh, drifts at a certain point and certain depth, but also goes down and up to make a continuous measurement of temperature and salinity in this case. And so it leads to the kind of data set you have here at the bottom right. Um, so temperature versus uh, time and depth. Um, and again, we now have notebooks to just query that and, and get this sort of data set and start simulating them. 
Uh, in fact, this data set is important enough that I decided to put in a separate package, which is called Argo Data Jail. The QR code, as in other places in my presentation, will lead you to it. All right. Um, so this was for um, the modeling, the, sorry, the uh, ac accessing and, and using uh, of real data uh, from those ocean robots. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the simulation part. And this is where um, the SciML um, software comes, comes into play a fair amount. Um, so this is done typically through a package that I've called individual displacements or GL, uh, which takes a set of flow fields or um, um, a term that says how much you're going to move something um, and, and uses that through a differential equation solver. And so the equations that are just uh, written here, they are the same, just slightly different. Uh, the idea is on the left-hand side, you have the derivative of position. So that's displacement. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have a flow field, which would be the ocean currents. Maybe you can take that from the climatology if you don't have it from um, the data. Uh, we can combine different sets of uh, products to get something that's realistic at different scales, so on and so forth. And so you can start playing um, games with those virtual um, observing platforms. The second line is just meant to say that, you know, on top of it, you can add active um, components to the, to the right-hand side, things like flotability to move something up and down, or propulsion. In some cases, some, um, some of the technologies we use do propel. And uh, yeah, so that part is sort of covered. So now we have the simulation of the platforms. The next part is the sensor. So what are they observing? What are they sampling? Uh, and so for this, there's a series of different uh, packages that I use, and they're listed here. MeshOS is something I presented in 2018 at Julacon, actually, uh, to handle gridded model output. Um, ocean state estimation is a package that gives me um, gridded variables from Earth observation. In fact, we talked about this sort of things a little bit uh, in a previous session today. Um, we organized the, the Julia for Earth observation workshop if you want to take a look, that's, that's going to be online soon. Um, climate model GL is what I use to uh, run climate scenarios and embed all of this. And then ultimately, we also want to consider uh, models of the marine ecosystem because that's one of the, of the key things we try to, to keep track of is how much are we disrupting marine life um, through warming the planet and, and other issues. So this is that, and a couple of quick examples. Um, so this is using, as I said, individual displacement gel uh, to simulate the drifting buoys. Here, every one of those lines um, represents a trajectory of a virtual particle put into the flow field. Um, there are certain interesting patterns here, but you might notice that the lines converge in some places. That's important because that's where the so-called great plastic patch is accumulating a lot of the garbage that unfortunately we also put in the ocean. Um, so this to say, um, this work has also implications for marine pollution. And in the first place, we have ways to simulate um, these pathways of ocean robots. Here is for my drifting profiler example. So here again, we have a, in this case, a three-dimensional flow field dump a bunch of virtual particles in there, advect them, that's what's on the left-hand side, and then we start generating profile data of temperature and salinity, um, which is what's on the right-hand side along the trajectory. So once we have all those things together, we have our virtual um, ocean robots, and then what we are left to do is embed them in climate scenarios and so on. So I'm not going to go into much more about this part, but I'm going to highlight interactivity uh, because I think it's one of the places where the Julia ecosystem makes it a very good case that it should be used for these sort of things. Um, and so I'm going to highlight a few things. Um, one is, let me go out of this and see, because since I'm going to show interactivity, I might as well do it on the screen. Um, so I'm a big fan of Pluto Notebooks. Um, for that reason that they let you interact with models um, and data uh, in an interactive way and communicate about them. 
So here is an example of you know, a model that's in fact C++ model that I run through the climate model GL package, um, which we will talk about in a different session in, uh, at 420. Um, it generates a bunch of um, climate scenarios and then you, know, you, can, you can start interacting with uh, the models in a simple way to changing parameters and text files. So for example, here I did this little perturbation to it. Uh, if I change, uh, let me change this. Oh. Right, and then you just rerun the model. And if you go, you have a, there we go. Um, now you have a different climate. So you can start generating different climates like this. And then here's an example where I combine this climate scenario with real data. Uh, so this is also a way to illustrate the use of the Earth observation packages. And, and so this gets SST from, uh, sorry, sea surface temperature um, from observations from satellite data. And then what this notebook does is it says, okay, let's, let's say that we are now in 2023. And we have a scenario that we've chosen depending on what we do to the, to the planet in the future and it's advanced, you know, 50 or 60 years or whatever, just to see the warming happen. And now we have our, you know, our virtual climates to observe. This last one is the, um, the particle tracking uh, that I've mentioned before. And so here again, you know, you can start playing with the, the notebooks and all of a sudden you're doing like interactive science. Um, so here the blue points are the original position and they get moved. Um, so Pluto Notebooks, a great asset. Um, another one that I really love for um, interacting with data and models is um, Mackie. And so I'm going to show you a bit of this um, where you've shown the rest. Um, so the great thing about Mackie is, well, there's many great things about Mackie, but one of them is it has this interactive uh, interactivity built in. Uh, so this is GL Mackie, which I'm going to show you. And that comes very handy because we want to be able to access large data sets. Um, so this is a placeholder for that. Uh, this is from a kilometer scale uh, model. Um, that's a Fortran model at this point. Uh, but it's the same things that the Klima program is doing uh, in Julia. And so that's the interactivity I'm talking about. What you're looking at are those kind of kilometer scale um, gradients of temperature from this pretty large data set. So based on these tools, the Julia ecosystem, and Mackie specifically here, we are able to you know, interact with this, these large data sets and kind of query them and, and, and go back and forth. There's one thing that you know, may be a bit Disappointing here is it's, it's kind of girls grained. Um, that has been resolved in a sense um, by the creation of the Tyler.jl package, which I'm going to also highlight briefly here. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen this. This is the same tool that's used for OpenStreetMap uh, kind of applications. And so this is nice because now it's interpolating on the fly and it lets you query like explore these global fields. You know, I'm starting from very local and just zooming out. Right, and then you can start looking at these big data sets and just go in with the interpolation on the fly. So I think this is a, a really nice addition to the ecosystem that I wanted to highlight. And it's the sort of uh, user experience that I'm after essentially, being able to provide a complicated workflow that starts from running a climate model, querying a bunch of other data sets that may be massive along the way, doing it all interactively and doing science afterwards. So this was my presentation for today. I'm going to just leave it to that. Um, it's a project that leverages a lot of Julia packages. And I have to say I'm indebted to a lot of you here probably uh, in that regard. Uh, the set of packages that I've uh, deployed and, and discussed today um, leverage, um, well, give you access to real ocean data sets. And they also provide you the means to simulate them. And so they, they form the backbone of, of this digital twin framework that I'm uh, envisioning. And I've showcased the interactivity that Julia enables around this, which is going to be key. Thank you.
um, all of this to open new avenues of ocean and climate science, um, hopefully also influence policy. You'll find all of this uh, on GitHub. Um, best place to start is probably my own sort of GitHub uh, profile. A lot of the packages that I've described are um, spread across two organizations, um, Julia Climate and Julia Ocean. We're always looking for contributors, and so if you are interested in these sort of things, you know, please do uh, join us. And at the bottom, I've just highlighted some of the other organizations that uh, play a big role in what I'm doing for this. Um, so SciML, Pluto, and Maki in particular. Uh, but I should also have mentioned, you know, Julia Geo and, and organizations like that. Um, that's all. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll take any questions you have. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions from the audience? Thank, thank you for this, for this talk, it's very wonderful, but uh, you wanted to highlight the interactivity, but papers aren't really interactive. Is this something that could be done a bit differently in the future with sharing these kinds of awesome interactive tools? Uh, you said papers? Yeah, like publications. Oh, I see. Um, well, publications are a bit, you depend on the editors, right? So it's sort of, um, the answer sort of depends who you're talking about in a sense. There are, there are journals that are pretty good at supporting interactive computation already. Um, one thing that, you know, I didn't touch much about or discuss much is cloud computing in general. Um, I'm a... I'm kind of a fan of that in, in the way of not necessarily paying for it, but in the way of distributing um, materials through that. Um, and I like, by example, Docker as a way to instantiate it on your local machine without you know, asking AWS for, uh, uh, for services. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I think the way to make scientific publications interactive, more interactive and reproducible, uh, is by providing recipes that are reproducible, archiving data sets on like, you know, permanent archives with DOIs, and then providing the computational environment, uh, if not the electricity and the computer power itself. Make sense? Yeah, cool, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, so, are there any methods for monitoring uh, coral bleaching trends around the world as part of, as part of the Julia Climb Library? So, can you, can you please repeat the beginning? Uh, yeah, so, um, are there any methods of monitoring coral bleaching trends around the world using uh, Julia, uh, Julia Climate or Julia Ocean? Oh, coral bleaching. Okay, sorry. So, thank you. Um, so, this is not something that's explicitly addressed yet. It's a good one to add. Um, one topic, though, that is really directly related is um, um, the work with the Julia uh, for Earth Observation uh, group. So we had a workshop at the beginning of the year to sort of bring together the community that um, deals with Earth Observation, wants to work with Earth Observation in Julia, and so on and so forth, developers of packages. Um, and you know we made quite a fair, you know, a, 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 a bit of progress. Um, and I think there are several kind of data sets from the satellite that you can apply. Um, those that uh, sense um, the surface topography can be one. Um, those that sense, um, um, you know, ocean color. If you're familiar with this, uh, ocean color is a measurement of um, the reflectance of kind of the sun on the uh, on the ocean, if you like. Um, so those give. Um, can give hints you know, at the global scale um, as to what happens to coral. Uh, I think there are dedicated scientific projects that observe them much more regionally um, that you know, I would love to plug into this, but it's not been done yet. Any further questions? Then I would have one more. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on the connection between data and the models? What is it? Is it, is it just parameter fitting or are you using neural ODEs or how do you use the data for in, in order to um, 
to optimize your models or to make them better? Right. Um, so it sort of depends on, on, on the project. Um, over the years, I've been involved with a bunch of different things. Um, the one of the, the, the big one, maybe, uh, is a project that's now continued by NASA uh, that produced this ocean reanalysis. And so that is using, currently, um, in fact, a Fortran model uh, that has a automatic differentiation with it. And so we do that kind of a big curve fitting exercise in that one. That includes parameter optimization, boundary surf surface boundary conditions, something like that. In other projects, uh, what I'm looking at is um, taking the, the particle tracking devices and training them from the data. I'd like to learn about you know, the, the, uh, the dispersive statistics there. Um, the third one is more related to uh, neural networks in a way. And so trying to go from um, you know, a model that represents something like the mine ecosystem, a complicated thing, and, and, and predict from there observables. All right, so that's one step in there as well. Um, does that help? Yeah. Cool. Thank okay, you. so let's thank, thank the speaker again. <laughs> and our next speaker is Miles Quenmer, and he will talk about interpretable machine learning with symbolic regression dot JL. Ready to go? Okay, and this, the stage is yours. Okay, uh, thanks for coming, thanks for inviting me. So I'm gonna talk today about uh, my symbolic regression package, symbolicregression.jl. Um, so this is a, a machine learning package written purely in Julia for doing uh, model discovery with genetic algorithms. So um, I'll first thank my, uh, the various contributors. So these are the, the people I work with in kind of the science applications. Um, and then there's a long list of uh, GitHub contributors um, I'm, I'm sure some of you are here. I, I'm not good at faces, so if you are, um, feel free to chat after. Um, so I'm going to talk about really kind of four packages. So the, the main package is uh, symbolicregression.jl. Um, this is a uh, package for uh, discovering expressions that fit data. There's also Pyser, which is kind of a Python uh, wrapper. Uh, and then the two kind of back-end packages are dynamic expressions and then this new package, uh, dynamic quantities for uh, unit evaluations. So I'm going to start with the motivation. So like, why do I want this? So I think, so my background is, is, is science. Um, I want machine learning to give me a model that I can understand. Like I want it to give me a model in a language I can understand. Um, this has many benefits, so I can get insights into existing models. Um, I can understand the biases of my model. I can understand if it has some kind of weird learned shortcut. Um, and I can place uh, stronger priors over the space of models. Um, so luckily, science already has a modeling language, which is very good, and that is math, right? So um, you know, in, in computer vision, like I think part of the reason we like to use um, convolutional neural networks and just really flexible models and train them on a lot of data is because we don't really have a language for, say, describing an image of a cat, right? But we do have a really good language for science, mathematics. Um, it's, it's very accurate at modeling the universe. So I think the, the problem here um, is that if we have kind of this knowledge embedded in a model, um, we don't really get insights out of that. So if you look at the history of science, a lot of the time there has been some empirical discovery of some law. So maybe Kepler's third law would go on to motivate uh, Newton's law of gravitation. Uh, Planck's law is actually, that's another empirical equation that was discovered um, with some kind of theoretical 
motivations, but that would require quantum mechanics to partially explain that. Whereas if you have some neural network and it's just all kind of embedded in this parameter space, um, you, don't, you don't really get insights out of it. Um, so I think, so this is just some cheat sheet for physics 101. You can see so many relations in physics are just simple expressions. So this is a really good prior, not only for uh, building general models, but also for interpretability, because you can kind of, uh, if you have a model in this language, you can, you can see how it's related to your existing models. Um, so symbolic regression, it's a machine learning task where the objective is to find analytic expressions that optimize some objective, some, uh, some function, okay? Um, so this was popularized by John Koza in the 1990s, kind of using genetic algorithms for this. Um, and then Hod Lipson uh, popularized this in science. Um, so I, like, I really like this figure. This is from Jay Wadakar's paper. Um, you can kind of have this, I forget the name of it. It's like some character diagram, but basically uh, the outer ring is kind of the max amount. The inner ring is minimum. And there's five categories. So we have expressivity of model, high dimensional performance, uh, interpretability, training speed, generalization. Um, and we can compare symbolic regression, deep learning, and maybe decision trees. So like maybe XGBoost. Um, and you can kind of evaluate the performance trade-offs and where you would actually want to use this. Because uh, symbolic regression it is, uh, it's not as expressive as, say, uh, deep learning, but it's very interpretable and you tend to get better generalization for physics problems. Uh, and then decision trees are kind of in the middle. Um, so uh, one other motivation for this, and by the way, feel free to ask questions throughout. I'm happy to take questions. Um, so another motivation for this is something that we've, we've kind of termed symbolic distillation. So if you have some, like the advantage of neural networks is they're very expressive. And so you can kind of use symbolic regression to understand neural networks and kind of uh, distill them into my domain specific language. So um, it, it, it's kind of an interpretability tool as well. Okay, so I'm gonna talk through the methods now. Are there any questions on the motivation? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so in many genetic, so many symbolic regression methods, you represent expressions as trees. Um, generally, binary operators are all you need. Uh, so unary and binary operators. So for example, this tree, uh, z plus two sine z, um, you can represent it as this binary tree, and then it has some representation in uh, function space. Um, so the way you explore the space of expression trees is uh, kind of the best way to do this, which is a classical method, but it still works really well, is uh, evolution. So you can kind of think of this tree as like a DNA sequence and just apply like mutations. Um, you can apply crossovers. So if you have two expressions which are kind of good but in different ways, maybe you can like cross over parts of the expression tree. Um, so the way the library symbolic regression.jl works is it uses this classic idea of evolution um, and it, it, it basically just fine tunes it and kind of uh, generalizes it. And so the, the key idea is it's called age regularized multi-population evolution. So if I have a population of expressions Okay, so maybe I have like 100 expressions. How I evolve this is I randomly pick some of them. So maybe I randomly sample two expressions from that population. Of those two, I score them. So I evaluate their fitness, so maybe their accuracy in fitting my data. Then the one that wins that comparison, so we call it a tournament, uh, you would apply some kind of perturbation to it to explore the space. So maybe you mutate it, you, you turn a division into a multiplication, um, you could do a crossover, so you could kind of mix two expressions, maybe you do an algebraic simplification, or 
maybe you do a constant optimization. So you basically just, like, the idea is really simple. You just go through this loop, and you just try to make this loop as fast as possible, and all of these uh, operations kind of optimal. Like, you, you want to have good weightings on the different pathways. But the, the key, like, there's not really any crazy, like, deep learning or anything. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's evolution. You're basically simulating evolution on expressions. Um, so the, there's a few things that uh, symbolicregression.jl does. So one of them is parallelism. Uh, you can think of this as every population of expressions lives in a, uh, either a thread or a process, and they evolve independently. Um, and that lets you scale this up um, to thousands of cores over a cluster because they can each evolve independently. Um, and then once in a while, you have this migration step. So maybe this island sends over its best uh, members to a different island and they kind of exchange. So you can think of this as like, okay, maybe one island is specialized to uh, maybe like polynomials, and maybe the other island is specialized to I don't know, like trigonometry, and they kind of like exchange their best. So it, it really like tries to simulate um, evolution, and this helps it kind of explore the space. Um, because it, it's not a differentiable space, like it, it's really not nice to optimize in this space. Um, so you, you need all these different tricks. So this is a video I spent way too long making, um, so I'm gonna play it multiple times. But this is essentially how it looks. So you have this tree, and you're kind of evolving it, to match that orange line. So you have like constant optimization, uh, kind of adding a node at the top of the tree, another constant optimization. I'm gonna play it again because I labored for this GIF. Okay, yeah, so maybe you add a node uh, and then it's kind of exploring different pathways. Those are kind of like individuals, add another node. Um, and and this, is, this is how it explores the space. Like, it's not gradient descent, it's evolution. Um, there are some strategies for doing gradient descent in this space, but it's, uh, you, you kind of run into numerical instabilities. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll talk about the library. So symbolicregression.jl is, is the core library. Um, I, I designed it kind of, so when I started it, there was, there was different kind of proprietary packages, and I was really kind of annoyed because people couldn't reproduce um, my results, because I, I was kind of like a user of symbolic regression, and I kind of became a developer out of necessity. So symbolic regression tries to satisfy the things I wanted, so I wanted it to be as high performance as possible, I wanted it to be as configurable as possible, um, and I wanted it to be easy to use. So symbolic regression really tries to do all of those things. So it gets high performance by, and I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more, it, it uses uh, vectorized evaluation kernels, um, there's native support for distributed computation, uh, it tries to be as configurable as possible, so you can pass it custom operators, they don't even need to be continuous, uh, you can have custom constraints, like physics-based constraints, whatever, um, custom types, so you can put in like fixed point floats, whatever, um, and custom objectives too. Um, so easy to use, uh, I'll show an API example soon. So part of the issue with exploring the space of symbolic expressions is that you're dealing with these dynamic um, expressions. Like this is a symbolic, uh, it's just a list of symbols and I need to evaluate this really, really quickly. So if you just do eval in Julia, you don't get great performance, right? Because it has to compile and evaluate this. So uh, symbolic regression was designed with this, this one struct called operator enum. It's basically a vector of functions. So I say, uh, you're allowed to use these binary operators and these unary operators. Um, you could also have like the different, the first derivatives of those. Um, but once you have this enum, um, then it kind of uses that to compile the evaluation kernels. So I'll give an example. So if I have this tree, right, this tree would be represented 
as this node type. So this is a mutable struct. Um, it's all fixed, so there, it's kind of um, it's kind of like a like a sum type kind of. So you have it's completely type stable, um, and you have a degree field which basically says is this a binary tree or is this a binary node or a unary node or whatever. Um, so for that green node, you can see it's a binary node, so degree is two. Uh, it's not a constant, obviously, so it's false. There's no value stored, so that's just nothing. There's no feature, so maybe zero. The operator is an integer, so that's to make it really lightweight because you're kind of copying these, uh, you're, you're generating a lot of expressions. So that needs to be lightweight, so that's just three. Maybe it's the third operator in my enum. Um, and then the L and R are just the children. Okay, now this is all fixed. So what happens is if you have a tree with, uh, if you have like a one degree node, basically it just doesn't assign anything to R. Um, and so instead of like having, it could be the node or nothing. Um, so the way it actually evaluates this is it basically just traces through the tree recursively. Uh, so this is the example of a zero degree node. So this is a leaf in the tree. It checks, is this leaf constant? If it is, it just generates a fill matrix uh, with the same shape and the same type. So if it's like a sparse array, you want, uh, or I guess like if it's a static array, you want also a static array. And then it, if it's not a constant node, so it's like a feature node, um, then you just index. The second flag here, um, that's just a, like a technicality. It's basically just a faster way to um, deal with NANDs rather than having to do a try catch. Um, so you get really good performance when you start doing things like fusing functions. So this example is a evaluation kernel for a one degree node followed by a two degree node. And so what it's doing here is it's specialized to the operator and the child operator. Um, and what that lets it do is put all of those operators into the same for loop. So it can just go really, really fast. And it's essentially like it compiles the cosine, maybe it's like a cosine and a plus, and it will compile those into the for loop rather than needing to get those um, dynamically. So when you have that, you can get down to, say, uh, like 700 nanoseconds rather than 117 microseconds. Um, so by having these, like an enum over operators and then just fixed evaluation kernels, you can get much, much faster performance. Even when you do things like randomly changing the expression, you can still get really nice speeds. And, and speed is everything for um, genetic algorithms like this. Like you just want to go through that loop as fast as possible. Um, there's some other nice things. So in this uh, node type, there's diff you can kind of treat it like a collection, which is really convenient. So for example, if I want to get a list of all the degrees in the tree, I can just use map. Um, if I want to check, is this tree like constant or does it have some variable? I can, I can just do a all and just treat the tree like a collection. So it'll just do a depth first um, traversal. Um, and that's just useful for doing like custom constraints or objectives where you need to symbolically manipulate it. Okay, so the way the library is structured is symbolic regression.jl is kind of the core uh, uh, equation discovery package. Dynamic expressions is the, that holds the evaluation kernels. Then these are the dependencies. So dynamic expressions.jl depends on loop vectorization for the fast kernels um, and, and zygote for uh, compiling the uh, first derivatives. Um, there's also optim.jl and that's for doing constant optimization. So that kind of sits on top and, and once in a while it does an optim loop. Um, there's also cluster managers.jl for cluster compute. So if you're doing like a thousand cores um, on a Slurm cluster, you would 
plug in one of those, uh, and then MLJ for the API. Um, so those are the, the kind of in the dependencies. There's downstream exports, so Picer I mentioned earlier. So that's the Python version of symbolic regression.jl. Um, that is connected with PyJulia, and that's kind of like a scikit learn style library where the back end is Julia. Uh, and that has connections to PyTorch and SymPy. And then if you want to use like a computer algebra system, there's symbolic utils.jl. So there's a converter to that as well. So if you discover an expression, you can kind of uh, export it to different libraries for downstream analysis. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of other dependencies as well. Okay. Um, so the, the way the, the, I'll just show a few other structures. These aren't that interesting, basically you have this population structure, and that just stores all the expressions. It's just a vector of pop members, and pop members have a expression and a loss, basically. There's a couple other things just for caching. Um, but that's kind of the, the core data type. Um, I'm gonna skip this one, actually, but essentially what happens is, like I mentioned earlier, that each population lives on a core, uh, so you, you feed in options and data set to this equation search function, and it just spawns populations on different uh, threads or processes. And those kind of go through their, their loops, and once in a while they migrate. So they migrate between uh, populations. Um, and that, so the migration actually really helps kind of explore the diversity of this uh, expression space. That at the very end you get the best expressions seen during the search. So th this is what it actually looks like. So maybe I want to do a distributed search, so I, I do my add procs, I create this list of processes, um, and okay, so I'm gonna, so maybe I have, uh, so this is using the MLJ interface, and maybe I define some custom loss function. So this loss function looks at the squared difference in log space. I don't know, just, um, just some loss function. Then I create my model. So I'll talk about these steps. So this is an SR regressor. This is how you would typically use this if you're doing some kind of downstream search. Um, you declare the operators it's allowed to use. So here it's plus multiplication minus division. You could also have unary operators as well. Uh, the parallelism, this is like, do I want to use multi-threading or multi-processing? Both work, where you can do a serial search. Um, then the other thing, so I set my element-wise loss. So this is like the loss I wrote above. Um, and then uh, turbo equals true. This is like the loop vectorization. So th these are the different hyperparameters for your search. Um, you can customize these things as much as you want. These binary operators, they're any Julia function. Like they don't have to be, these are not special functions. Like they're just any Julia function you could write, you could have it as one of the operators. Um, so you could even do, um, I don't know if anybody knows the fast inverse square root, that example. It's like this crazy, what? Yeah. <laughs> So, so you can actually find that with uh, symbolic regression because you can, you can search for like the actual bits, um, which is cool. Um, yeah, the, the fast inverse square root, yeah, you can find it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it takes like a lot of cores, but you can't find that. And you would basically declare some binary operators that do bit manipulations. Um, Okay, so I declare my model, then, so this is MLJ stuff, so I say this is my model and my data, uh, and then I do a fit. Uh, oh yeah, so this is my actual data. So this is, this is the Ames housing data set. It's basically trying to predict housing price from a list of variables. Um, create my machine, and then I'm gonna fit, so I've, allocated some processes, maybe these are on some cluster, uh, whatever, I'm gonna do my fit. And this is what the output looks like. So, I mean, this is the first time, so it's gonna compile everything. Uh, it's gonna set up the workers. 
And then it's going to do this. So it's going to give you this output. So this is a table of the best expressions seen at each complexity. And you can see, it, so it's used the variable names that we gave it um, in a table. Um, and you can see like these are the predictions for housing price as a function of the variables. You can see the loss column, the complexity. And so like the complexity three expression is like the, the living area. That seems like it should be correlated with housing price. Um, and you can see like as we add more complexity, you get more accurate fits, but it's maybe less interpretable. Um, so this is really quick, like this is not a full search, um, but you can see it kind of gives you nice interpretable expressions this way. Um, so I'll just skip through. Once we have that, we can do a report. So you can do report of the machine, and it gives you lists of expressions. Um, and maybe I want to convert it to like symbolic utils. So I can do node to symbolic um, and uh, get like a symbolic expression. And then I can use this in a computer algebra system, simplify it, uh, right? Like I can do simplify, whatever. Okay. Um, so I'll just quickly mention the Python API um, if relevant. So the I mean, like most Python libraries are, are kind of like C backend Python front end. So, so Python is kind of like Julia backend Python front end, um, which I think is a really interesting space to explore um, to kind of get those users who may not use like pure Julia libraries, but you can kind of access a larger market essentially. Um, so Python actually has more users than the Julia version, um, even though all the kind of, all the algorithms are on the Julia side. Uh, I'll show some quick examples. So this was a really cool paper by this student at uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and some people here at MIT. Um, they used symbolic regression.jl to find an optimal expression on an FPGA that approximated their neural network. So um, here, you treat complexity of an operator as the number of clock cycles on the FPGA. So you're trying to find an expression that is essentially the fastest possible expression for that data. Um, and so this is where Julia's multiple dispatch is really nice because you can just stick in the native FPGA like fixed point number types and give the correct operators and whatever. Um, so you can get this like, they have like a five nanosecond inference time on the FPGA, but it's like a 90% accuracy of the neural network. So, so this is like not really interpretability, but it's a nice example of uh, how you can explore this space. Um, so there's a, if you want to see the other papers, there's this list on this website. There's a, quite a few different like equation discovery papers that have used it. Uh, and I think I'll stop there, but I, I'm, so if you're interested in participating, I really welcome contributors. There's like a long wish list that I won't go through. Um, there's like 20 different things I, I think would be really useful to have. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks. Take questions. So are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, great talk. And I got to email you. I keep on forgetting to. Um, oh, one, yeah. one question that came up, though, when, when looking at this, is it looked like you had a fundamental instability in the way that, you're, uh, that you were doing the uh, operators. Have you looked into using the beta version uh, 1.10 uh, uh, opaque closures or using function wrappers for handling the, the vector of operators? Because right, right, oh. as of right now, right, as a vector of functions, right, you're going to yeah, have yeah. a boxing problem. Yeah, so actually, so the first thing I did was just have a tuple there, and so it would actually specialize to the operator, but I yeah. found it didn't really affect the performance. Okay. So I just did it as a vector because then I can take advantage of pre-compilation. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. Um, I mean, I might, like, try it again. Maybe there's a Maybe there's other ways to kind of reduce performance. But essentially, the kernel specialized to the functions. Um, mm -hmm. So even if you pre-compile with like a different enum, you get those cached mm -hmm. um, kernels. And, is nice. and what is the, the main overhead now, like uh, at, at, the, at the current point? Yeah, so I would say the main overhead is probably... Um, and yeah, also, do, do, the, do, do the features and operators, do they need to be ints, or could they be specialized to like int8 and int16 and such? Yeah, so they could definitely be int8. Um, 
it's really, so it's still kind of the kernels, like the evaluation kernel. So that mm -hmm. loop is still kind of the bottleneck, even though it's been like so heavily optimized. So some things I've, I've been kind of experimenting with is I mentioned this like fused kernel. So you could think about just like having a general kernel that can fuse like any number of operators. Um, I haven't gotten it working as fast as I want. So it seems like two operators are kind of the limit, but I think that would be interesting to try because that is mm -hmm. still kind of like the bottleneck. Um, the algorithmic side, I think choosing the correct weightings of the different mutations, that's kind of the algorithmic limitation right now. Yeah. So there's yeah. some like MCTS approaches and I think those would be really cool to try. Yeah, super cool stuff. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, first of all, thanks for the for the great presentation. Uh, I had a small question. So earlier in the presentation, you showed um, how different populations interact and can cross over. But uh, because it's an embarrassingly pro uh, parallel problem, in practice, you choose to uh, sort of implement this in independent tasks and uh, processes. Uh, so implement what? Implement Sorry? the populations actually uh, growing in in their own independent processes, right? Yeah. So they they migrate between each other. So and yeah, that, there's the crossover. So that's, that, the crossover is kind of like a mutation. Like it's like within a population, you could randomly kind of like breed two expressions. I understand. Yeah. So how are you? Uh, how do you basically implement uh, crossover between two populations? And uh, does that not? Oh, so the so the you only get crossover between two expressions. Okay. The 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 way populations mix is. Uh, uh, migration. And so there's no actual exchange of like expressions here. It's just you're, you're cutting up part of a population and moving it to the other one and, and vice versa. Um. Thanks. Um, just if you go back, I think one slide or yeah, that one. So with your um, sort of randomly uh, sam sampled set of expressions, yeah. um, now you say that you just replace the oldest. Yeah. Um, now, I've got a colleague who's been doing a lot with um, evolutionary approaches um, and expression building using actually stack-based languages, but he's spent quite a bit of time investigating different strategies with actually managing the uh, population of um, available expressions, mm. um, in his case, functions. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if that's something you've investigated much, for example, having a curate, uh, sort of semi-curated subspace of uh, diverse expressions, for instance, instead of just having yeah. the newest ones. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting to explore. Um, but yeah, I haven't investigated it thus far. The replace oldest, so that is like a, I think it's maybe, I don't know, it's, it's a bit newer in genetic algorithm sense, so it's like maybe 10, 20 years old, and it's called age regularization, because traditionally you would replace the worst expression, but here you replace the oldest. Um, but I think in general, yeah, it would be really interesting to try uh, managing the population like in a, with different uh, summary statistics and optimizing for different things rather than just age. I think it would be cool. Uh, yeah. I, sorry, I yeah. guess we need to yeah, clarify the rest really offline. I have okay. a couple of questions myself, but okay, yeah. <laughs> I will talk to you later okay. on. Thanks. So uh, thanks to speak again for the great talk. And our next speaker is Helmut Strey from the Stony Brook University. And Helmut will talk about neuroblocks.jl, biomimetic modeling of neural control circuits. I guess you also use that, Mark? Okay, so the stage is yours. What? Q and A. Just press this. Green will come on. And use this for the Q. Oh, okay. Um, so, th is this working? Oh yeah. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so I want to show you um, our package neuroblocks.jl. Uh, Actually, also neuroblocks the the GUI, uh, neuroblocks brain circuits. Uh, let me just introduce the, the group that is working on it. So these are the people 
who came up sort of with this idea. Um, this is my wife over here. Um, so we're both at Stony Brook University. Um, then we have a team at MIT, so Alan Edelman and Chris, Chris is here um, at MIT, CSAIL. Uh, then we have a collaborator at MIT uh, the, the, in neuroscience, uh, Earl Miller, and then we're collaborating also with Rick Granger at Dartmouth, and he's a computational neuroscientist. Um, so we're interested in humans, human brains, um, but what we're doing is any model that we are, what we are creating and we're also validating on, uh, on monkeys uh, because they, you know, the problem is that we are not, not mice. Um, so, so we have to work with, with, with brains um, that are close enough to humans. Uh, we also have two co uh, co collaborators, uh, clinical collaborators um, at McLean Psychiatry and uh, MGH Neurosurgery. Um, we are multi-scale, multi-model, multi-system um, simulations. Uh, we are modular, biomimetic, and intuitive, and we hope to be a community-based modeling platform. Um, I will talk later about this. So this is our um, team, uh, programmer teams. We have several staff scientists. We have a few um, PhD students. We are lucky to have actually a dedicated graphic designer that works on this team. And we have a GUI developer, and we just added two beta testers. Uh, they're actually both from MGH neurosurgery. And um, our code base is, has, is growing. Um, but let me first tell you the motivation of our work and why we started neuroblocks.jl. Um, in general, when you look at brain-based disorders, um, it, there's a consensus that they work pretty much exactly like all other diseases um, because they're based on circuit dysregulation. And I just wanted to give you an example. Um, this is a very you know, commonly known uh, regulation, uh, glucose insulin regulation. So if you look at a healthy person has relatively stable blood sugar, um, but if you have a disease um, that, that affects the insulin, um, then, then it's more, more fluctuating. And the, the circuit is very simple actually, right? So if you have blood glucose, if the blood glucose is, is too high or if you anticipate eating sugar or something like this, right, that the pancreas creates insulin, the insulin interacts with the cells, the cells will take up uh, glucose from the, from the blood and you get back to this, the level that you want, right? Um, there's actually two places where this circuit can break. One is um, at this stage where you make insulin, right? And this is actually type one diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, you can make insulin, right? Therefore, the circuit is broken and you can regulate um, a blood sugar. That's why you have to inject insulin. Uh, it can also break here, where the connection between insulin and the cells are broken, right? And this is actually called type 2 diabetes. Um, and that means that the cells don't react to insulin and therefore not taking up the glucose and therefore the regulation is broken. Um, now, the current state of neuroimaging and neuroscience, to a certain extent, um, is so that when, when you do neuroimaging, you typically look at the brain and you look at activation areas, right? Um, and you relate these activations to like tasks or even diseases. Um, and all you can do essentially with this kind of data, you can essentially connect dots. You can say these are correlated, let's say, two regions are correlated. And at best, you can actually establish directed connections between, so you can establish causal relationships between, between these nodes. But what I wanted to point out, that these things are actually not circuits, right? not yet circuits. And that's why I think we had to do what we wanted, wanted to do. Um, I just also wanted to give you a control circuit in the, in the brain. This is actually my wife has been working on this for many decades. Um, you can see the, the symbols more remind you of an elect electric or control circuit. Um, I don't want to get into details, but it is essentially a circuit that is implicated in anxiety disorders. It's actually the circuit that controls um, your thre threat assessment. Right? You look at something, you say, is it a threat or not? And it can also be broken in two places. One, if you are a hyper responder, if you're anxious, 
then you're always creating, you have false positive messages, right? Something that is not a threat is a threat, and therefore you're anxious. Um, there's another place where this thing can break, and these are hyper-responders, and they have false negative. So you see a threat, but you think it's not a threat, right? And they, they are living very dangerous lives. Um, so very similar to you know, the glucose regulation, you can think about the brain. Um, so now the question is, how do we actually go from these control circuit things to actually brains? And the big question that we have to ask ourselves, so what are really the computational primitives in the brain circuits? It's pretty easy when you look at electronics. Electronics, you know, we have resistors, we have capacitors, right? we could have transistors, we could make all sorts of things. Um, but what is the equivalence in the brain? Um, I'm showing you one example. Um, this is called the winner-takes-all circuit. Um, and it's essentially a multimodal switch, or maybe a filter, my wife likes to talk, call, call it a filter. But the idea of the winner-takes-all circuit is that you have a bunch of excitatory neurons, and you have an inhibitor, one inhibitory neuron, and you have inputs, and the neuron that gets the most inputs shuts down the other neurons, right? So it's, there's only one active neuron in this, in this, in this, in this, in this circuit, microcircuit. And that's essentially to make decisions, right? You can, you can either, either the first one or the second one or the third one or the fourth one. And this is sort of like a basic, basic circuit. But we want to extend these, the, the library of, of computational primitives. Okay, the next problem is multiscale. If you think about it, I mean, if, if you have a brain disorder, right, um, it's, it, it manifests in behavior, let's say, right? Uh, addiction and so on. So at the scale that we can measure the human brain is let's say fMRI or EEG, that's very coarse, right? So I think, I think typically voxel sizes in fMRI are like a millimeter, maybe two millimeters and so on this. Um, EEG, you only have access to the, the, the scalp. Um, there are finer measurements. In monkeys, you can have put electrodes in, the, in their brain. You can also, in humans, deep brain stimulation, you can actually, uh, doing the surgery, you can, you can get very, very good measurement. That's why we collaborate with these people. But then ultimately, um, if you think about it, the molecules are the ones that we are interested in, right? So, so if you want to you wanna treat a, a brain disorder, then you give drugs, and the drugs will act on, on the bottom layer of this hierarchy. Right. And on the right, actually, we show, essentially, you go from cellular, molecular to individual neurons, right, to neuron assemblies, and only then on top you see what, you, what we see in neuroimaging. So we have to have models that are completely multiscale, that are hierarchical multiscale, from the bottom to the top. Okay. And then the other thing is uh, we also need to have a way of comparing models. We have to integrate them or we have to share them. So model comparison, right? So you, we want to know. You have, a, you, have an, you have a model for an amygdala, and, and you have one, and we want to see which one is better. Um, integration is a big problem in neuroscience, computational neuroscience. Somebody has a model. It doesn't integrate with any, any other model. If, if you have an amygdala, I have a thalamus, we can't talk to each other. Um, and sharing, um, there's a nice quote about sharing of neuroscientists. <laughs> okay, so this is why we started neuroblocks.jl. Uh, neuroblocks.jl is built on modeling toolkits, so we do everything in, in symbolics. Um, so what I wanted to do is, since most of you are probably not computational neuroscientists, also to speak a little bit about our experience to building big systems, right, with, with modeling toolkit and how to integrate um, lots of differential equations and, 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 and parameter sharing and, um, and so on. So I will show some, some code. Um, let's start with a very, very simple um, uh, computational primitive. Um, so this is a very common thing that people in neuros uh, computational neuroscience do. They, we have 10 to the 11 neurons in the inner brain, right? That's impossible to simulate, even yeah, if more slows continues. Um, so what people said is, let's take you know, a, a, a cluster of neurons, thousands of neurons maybe, and ask what is the average dynamic behavior of thousands of neurons? And typically it involves excitatory inhibitory neurons to go back and forth. 
And you essentially end up with a mean field approach to, to, to neuroscience. You, you get essentially a differential equation. So one of the famous uh, neural mass models is the jensen ritt model. And this is essentially a coupled differential equation. So you have x, which is the uh, dynamics of the excitation of the, of the neural activity, and y is some latent state. Okay? And then what we actually do is we, we pocket pack that into a block. right? And uh, we create a struct, which we call jensen ritt block. And then we define, essentially, outputs and the ODE system. And the ODE system is created, essentially, by writing out the equations, creating an ODE system, saving it. So how do you connect those, right? So by connecting those, you just essentially create all these blocks. And then you can e even uh, attach parameters to it. And then you define an adjacency matrix, how to connect all these things, the inputs to the outputs. You create a system, you structurally simplify it, you simulate it. Now, this is so simple that we were actually able, so, so one of the students came and gave, gave us a paper like on, on Parkinson's disease, right? It had essentially, I think it has seven or eight regions, no, seven. Um, I was able to put that into Neuroblocks in within an hour and we can actually reproduce the results. Can you imagine like you have a scientific paper you look at the results and you get instant, essentially, you can, you can test it, you can change your own parameters and so on. So this is, it took me a little longer to make this graph here, over there. Um, the other way of assembling um, systems, and I like this, by the way, the, 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 the graph way much better, uh, because it's more intuitive, is to actually assemble OD systems from graphs. So just imagine you have two regions, they're connected in a certain way, you have parameters, um, you can even have equations in the, in the connections. Essentially create the nodes, you create a directed graph, you add the blocks as vertice vertices, you add the edges, and you call ODE from graph. That's it. You have an, you have an, you have an ODE system, you simplify it, you, you simulate it. Um, now I want to talk to you about Super blocks. Super blocks are assemblies of blocks, right? Hierarchical. We want to build things hierarchically. Um, so this is an, an assembly. This is called the canonical microcircuit. It um, is essentially four different types of neurons that interact in a, in a, in a cortical column. Um, and there are, there are a lot of literature on this. Um, so how do you do this? So, so now this cortical column has four inputs and four outputs. Uh, you do the same thing. You essentially create another block, like another struct. Uh, this time it has symbolic arrays, inputs and outputs. And then you essentially go create the blocks. You add them as vertices. You add all the edges. And then you have to connect the outputs to the outputs of the blocks. That's it. Right? And now you have a struct. You have a, you have a block that connects four to four. How do you connect those super blocks? Uh, very simply, again, you create them, you create a graph, you add the super blocks as vertices, and now, instead of a weight, a single weight, you put a matrix, right? You put an adjacency matrix. So to essentially connect all the inputs to the outputs, right? Or actually the other way around. So if it's an edge, directed edge, you connect the outputs to all the inputs. And again, um, you call ODE from graph and you have a network. So let me show you an example of what we did last year, essentially, to build a huge system that explains something. And so we take the winner-takes-all circuit. It's a super block, uh, six inputs, five outputs. You connect them into a big, big system. Um, you can actually, if you connect them together sparsely, that thing behaves essentially like a cortical region. Right? And we build a visual cortex with this. We, we, we built a prefrontal cortex uh, with this. And this is the circuit. So we created essentially a cortical striatal thalamic loop um, circuit. And this is actually a model for pattern learning. So this we actually used in monkey data. There's, there's, there's experiments where monkeys learn patterns, right? two different types of patterns, and they, they get better and better at this. And so this is the circuit. It contains 650 neurons and several uh, neural mass models. And it takes about simulation 650 milliseconds for uh, no, to simulate 615 milliseconds, it takes about 50 seconds using a stiff solver. And this is work by Anand Patak and uh, Richard Granger. 
Um, so this is the, this, these are the results. Um, so we validated this. The interesting thing is, after we built it, we actually found features that weren't actually explicitly in the data. So, so that's, that's really a great, uh, great news for us. Um, so th these are actually the, 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 the uh, weights that change over time as, as the learning goes on. Um, I don't think you have to understand everything. Here on the right, essentially, is the behavioral learning. So it starts at 0.5, right? The monkey doesn't know which pattern is the right one. And then it goes almost 100% um, because they get rewards. Okay, um, I wanted to also mention that we now also started putting in stochastic differentiation, uh, st stochastic differential equations. Um, these are called stochastic blocks. We use the new feature of modeling toolkit that allows you to specify a Brownian um, noise as at Brownian here. Um, and also we are starting using the new system instead of OD system. Um, which allows you to then combine you know, SDEs and all sorts of um, uh, features. Um, the other thing that we just did, actually, and this is something very important. Chris, don't yell at me because it's horrible code, but it works. <laughs> um, so we just started, um, a huge annoyance to us was that we have some models that have 30 parameters, right? So imagine you have a model that has a block that has 30 parameters, you add let's say 100 of those together to make a dynamic system. That's 3,000 parameters, right? And most often, these parameters are actually the same between blocks, right? And it actually was very hard for us to get them to get together. And we just solved this, actually, last week. Um, I tried to make better code, but we will later. But it works. And the, and, and the way this works is that what you do is when you initialize the block, or the, the function Jensen rip block, you see these um, initializer, right? So you see tau is equal to 0 0.01. But tau could also be a symbolic parameter, right? Rather than a number, it could be a symbolic parameter that we want to share. And the way we do this is we essentially um, ask each parameter whether it's a number or whether it's a symbol or a num. And if it's a num, we change its parent scope. We go one down which means that on every level we can define parameters and they penetrate through the end to the ODE system. And just to show you how this works, so you create two Jensen Ritt blocks, right? You create a parameter, put that parameter into the parameter list as, this, as the same name, and then you can see at the end the ODE system has seven parameters rather than eight because these two parameters were combined into one. Um, also incredibly important for parameter fitting because if we have 3,000 parameters and we take a Jacobian or something like this with respect to 3,000 parameters, we would rather have every parameter that's independent to, be, to have a derivative. So that's, that's nice. So these are the collection of blocks that we have. Um, we have lots of neurons. Uh, we have Hodgkin Huxley neurons, integrate fire, leaky integrate, quadratic integrate fire. We have um, Jensen Vred, Wilson Cohen, pretty much anything that is in the literature. And if you have any wish, wishes, you can, you can contribute them. Uh, we have superblocks, canonical microcircuits, winner takes all. We are actually working on a cortical superblock, which means that we will have hundreds of inputs and hundreds of outputs um, of, these, of these things. Uh, we also have utility blocks. We can take data, band pass, filter them, then send them to another block, and so on. And then also stimulus blocks, because we need essentially blocks that create data, like, for example, a noisy input, or images. I mean, the, the, the monkey data are patterns that are, that are, that are um, shown to the cortic block. Um, OK. Now, I want to do a GUI demonstration. Um, one of the things that we always wanted to do is to make this tool available for anybody, anybody who doesn't know differential equations, who just wants to look at a model. Um, and the other idea is that, let's say, you using NeuroBlocks for your research, um, you get a result, you publish the result, then you can essentially save the model as a file. I mean, right now it's a JSON file, but I'm, we're working on other, other formats. And then you can import it into GUI, create essentially the OD system, and then you can change parameters and play around with this. 
Imagine you have publications that are interactive. Right? We were actually just talking about this right, with one of the uh, previous speakers. Um, so the GUI was uh, done by Adrian and Daniel initially. Um, it, 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 he's essentially behind uh, Genie.jl. And we hired another front-end developer for the last year, why it felt. So this is the GUI. Um, so we have different backgrounds. Uh, they don't have a meaning yet. Um, and then down here at the bottom, you have all the blocks that you can use. You just have to click one of these blocks, and you can see that they have different parameters. You can change the parameters. You can create another one. And then you can make connections, uh, directed edges. And then you can also choose what tr neurotransmitters um, constitute that edge. And you can also make self-connections. OK. And then we also have super blocks, right? So you can connect super blocks. Super blocks essentially have the number of outputs to inputs written on them. So you can, you can distinguish those. Um, so you can see Jensen rip block has only one output, so there's only one, and then four back because the CMC has four. Uh, this is, by the way, this is the Parkinson's model, right, that is importable. Um, so this is a seven region um, model. And essentially, this parameter changes the frequency of, this is actually what does the tremor in, in Parkinson's. Um, we can have neurons, you can do a neuron simulation uh, by increasing the input, you increase the frequency of the spikes. And this is actually a cool feature. So, what, uh, so here you can graphically, this is not actually in software, but it's graphically you can compress regions. Because if you think about it, if you have 100 regions, you want to you know, pack some away to the, in the corner. Here we can essentially do uh, cortical and subcortical, you know, uh, summarize them. And you can get the latex out, out, of, out of the thing, right? So you just click on it, and you get the equations out. We are not there yet that it writes the paper for you, but <laughs> we're working on it. OK. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so right now we're working, we're finishing actually parameter fitting. Um, so the idea is that all these models should be able to take data and then fit the parameters to it. Um, right now we're implementing, we implemented actually uh, what is called um, DCM, Dynamic Causal Modeling. Um, this is implemented in MATLAB in SPM 12, which is the most common software used in neuroimaging. So anybody in neuroimaging uses SPM 12 um, or derivatives of it. Um, but the idea of our kind of curve fitting using the same models is that you define a model, build a circuit, define the measurement, right? You say fMRI, EEG, whatever. It extracts essentially what you would measure, right? If this was, was the neural dynamics, then you essentially give the, give, give the data, you give the fitting method. So right now we have variational inference. So it's a Laplace uh, approximation. Uh, but we're also using ADVI, so um, automatic differentiation variation inference. Um, and the speeds, um, if you look here, so we have actually two versions. We took SPM 12. We translate it into Julia, we get some speed increase, but then if we add AD, we get even more speed increase. And we actually just managed to get the symbolic version to also do AD. So, so it's the same speed. Um, and here you can see that ADVI is actually better of, of predicting the ground truth than Laplace approximation, which should not be a surprise for anybody. Um, then the next step is we are um, finishing reinforcement learning. So I, I told you there was a whole system on, on learning. Um, so the idea is that we have a simulation, essentially. We run a simulation a certain number of time, uh, amount of time. Then we interrupt it with callbacks. Then we involve an agent that looks at the data, looks at the simulations, then changes the parameter to somehow optimize the cost function. Um, and that should be implemented in the GUI um, very soon. We have it already in code, but, but it needs to go get it in the GUI. Future directions. So in, in reinforcement learning, I think we should be finished by October. Uh, we also want to implement a more uh, Bayesian parameter fitting for neural data. Um, that also allows you then direct comparison between models, because you can 
take um, the, the, the ratio of the posteriors. Um, we have not implemented delayed differential equations, but Chris, they just implemented into modeling toolkit. So very, very nice. Um, and Neurobox GUI is already hosted on Julia Hub. Um, or at least it's very close. Um, you saw it already, I think. Um, wish lists, my wish list is that we create a domain-specific language for, for our, for our uh, circuits so that we can actually share uh, data better. And release of Neuroblocks is coming soon. I hope it's intuitive, it's fast, and we're hiring. Um, so if you're interested, talk to me. Okay, and it was funded by the Bazooki Brain Research Fund. I do just want to put a mention that there is a feature that is undocumented, so it's not your fault, uh, for pushing forward parameters. It comes from the, uh, from the fluid libraries. It was for the, made for the HVAC stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it's the feature known as domains. So it sounds like we, we have a, we have a, a, a hackathon project to, to actually document this and, and see if we can make use of it here. So I was curious, you when you talked about uh, the parameter estimation for your models, you mentioned that you're using uh, automatic differentiation variational inference, but then you said that you are going to implement Bayesian parameter estimation, so that would be, I guess, MCMC. And, and any specific reason why you want to do a Bayesian fitting here? I think I get it. Yeah. yeah I, 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 a quick one. <laughs> Just to ask, uh, where is the package? I couldn't find anywhere. Not in Julia Hub. Oh, it's private. Okay. Okay. Okay, I guess we need to talk afterwards because I'm thinking of limits of this approach because the simplest vehicle model I know is more complex than a block of your model. On the other hand, I think our brain is a little bit more complex than a vehicle. So I guess there must be some, some limits, but we can have a chat afterwards because we need to have a look at on, on, on the time. <laughs> Yeah, but the simple vehicle model can just drive in a circle and with the, with the constant velocity. <laughs> that's, that's also almost nothing. But we can discuss afterwards. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is Guillermo Augusto Zagatti. Uh, Guillermo is with the National University of Singapore. And he will talk about extending jump processes.jl for fast point process simulation.
Perfect. OK, so the stage is yours. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, so, so this is a work that I did in conjunction with my supervisor at the Uni University of Singapore, but also um, I got great support from uh, Chris uh, and Samuel, who are the maintainers of the library, and I very much appreciate uh, the support. Uh, so my, my main motivation for this uh, for this work was that um, I'm, I was working with uh, modeling social interactions. Uh, so so like uh, uh, how how uh, the likelihood that people come about with each other, like say in a conference like this. Uh, and, and then you can imagine uh, social interactions like like this plot on the on, on the left. Like so so these dots are are, are when when people people show up in in your sensor, and then and then like. The likelihood that you you're gonna show up depends on on previous information and your previous history, and 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 this is and then it also depends on who are you connected with. So if you're connected with certain people, you're more likely to show up at a certain time, let's say, and you can uh, describe this let's say intensity, this latent intensity, uh, with a graph like this one on the right. So so when I was looking for a library to model this kind of uh, as kind of interactions, uh, I couldn't find a general purpose library where I could just define the, the intensity function and then it would uh, simply uh, simulate the data that I was interested. Uh, so, so then I came across with uh, with, with uh, differential equations OGL, and I, I and then I I noticed that, that they were trying to simulate something very similar. So, uh, they, they were the jump process uh, .gl, which at the time was had a different name. It was called diff uh, ec jump, and and then I see there was a lot of similarity because the differential equation uh, can be decomposed in like in three parts. So, so there will be a deterministic component. Uh, so the dt part and, and then there, there, there might be two stochastic components. So the first one, uh, it's might maybe more familiar to most people, is the diffusion component. So for any time interval as small as you want, uh, there is always, always going to be a change. You don't know which direction you're going to go, if up and down, but there will be a change. So what changes with the, the jump component is that for, for a long period of time there will be no change. Uh, there's only like uh, th th there's a latent intensity, but there all, the system will undergo a, a sudden change at a specific period of time. So so it's a very it, it's a discrete uh, change, and and then like and, and to model this type of uh, change, you, you need uh, different types of algorithms than the ones you use for the deterministic and for the diffusion component. And at the time that I started contributing to the library, there was no uh, no, uh, th th there was th there was no uh, method to simulate jumps that uh, wi with any type of uh, variable intensity rate. There was one method, but it was not uh, very efficient. And then the objective was then to my objective was to make it more efficient and fast for for any for any type of intensity. So. So jump processes uh, or point processes can be used in a variety of applications. So here I, I listed a non-comprehensive uh, set of examples. Uh, so they are used in seismology, where like the algorithms that um, that I improved uh, came from. Uh, also in neuroscience, uh, I think you just saw in the presentation that came about. Uh, in finance and biochemistry, and the field that I'm interested, in, like in social media, in social interactions. Uh, and I can summarize uh, point processes by that by the other figure. So, so you have that wave that is con most time it's continuous and it, it, and it's called intensity. And then you have the actual dots that uh, are the actual events. And and here I'll, uh, I want to make a di digression and say and say why point processes and jump processes are the same. Like uh, is the view that the point processes are usually I, you can think about as a as a ruler, but you don't know. Uh, where are the numbers in the ruler? So basically, what you're saying is that, like, let's say from time one to time two, you have five points. So your ruler will will have will have a quantity equals to five, and then and then usually when you're dealing with uh, jump processes, you you may be counting since the beginning of time. So you don't necessarily need to have the concept of measure 
uh, and you don't need to maybe overcomplicate. But the, the key idea is that there will be only one event at a certain period of time. There will, you, you can, uh, the, the assumption is that you cannot have uh, multiple events happening exactly at the same time. But you can assume uh, that, uh, that there is a mark. So, so if an event happens, uh, you can draw from a distribution. And that distribution uh, can tell you many things about what happened at that exact time. Um, and then, uh, uh, if you're dealing with point processes uh, on the real line, so the support is uh, time, um, you can actually describe any point processes uh, with, with, a conditional, with a conditional intensity. And the conditional intensity is, it basically says what's the rate of the process per unit of time. So how many events you expect to, that will happen within the next, the next uh, second. And, and then it can be, and then you take into account, uh, and then you take into account the whole history of the previous events. So, so in a sense, is um, there is some cases where the jump might be a Markov process in the sense that you only use the the information from the previous step. But then in a more general sense, it, uh, your your process can depend on your infinite history uh, since the beginning of immemorial time. Uh, and, then another, and then another interesting thing is then once you define the conditional intensity, you can actually transform your process to using, using the sum of the conditional intensity since the beginning of time to something called a compensator. So the, the compensator is a way to transform your temporal point process or your jump process into a homogeneous point process with unit rate. And under, under the hood, uh, what most simulators uh, that simulate this type of data do is try to go from your Poisson distribution then to your, then to your uh, complex and difficult model by using a, a, a transformation that might look like that. Um, and also by using different techniques that try to create a mapping between uh, the exponential distribution and your crazy, uh, in the, your crazy model. Uh, so, so the contribution then of the uh, of the, the the new additions to the library were were to develop um, a method that would allow me to to have any any any, any type of uh, any type of conditional intensity that I wanted, uh, and then I would provide then you provide to to the library uh, the rate, and, and then in return you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get the the points that uh, uh, that will be simulated. Uh, in, in, and that, that was the main objective. Um, and then there are three, t three techniques for simulating a jump process. So, so the first one, which is um, the, 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 most, um, the, the most intuitive that, that, I made, that I touched upon before is the inverse method. So you take, you take your conditional intensity, then you invert into the Poisson distribution, which has inter-arrival inter time in terms of an exponential distribution. And, and then you just solve that system, you just solve this system here, over and over and over again. But the problem is that uh, with, the, with, the, with this approach, like, um, it's not very efficient because you have to evolve the conditional intensity at the same time that you need to find the time for the next event. And that can be very expensive because you're trying to nail that, that exact time where the system is gonna, where one side of the equation is gonna be equal to the other. Uh, the other approach is uh, thinning that, um, so you construct a process that is a homogeneous process, and then you 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 thin that process. So it's like you have a you have a water going through a sieve, and then you try just to let uh, some of the water through, and um, and with that, then you can reconstruct your process. And finally, uh, when you have uh, many processes happening at the same time, um, you, that you can use some some sort of queue to to queue like the next few events, and then. And then as you update the queue, you generate new events. Uh, so these are the three, uh, the three main uh, approaches that you can take to this problem. Uh, and, and here is, uh, is a very simple example of how you would do with the, with the library. So, so, once you, so, so in this case, you just want to simulate uh, a process that where a point happens every four units of time. It's very simple. But here's just to illustrate how you do it with jump process. Uh, so first you, def you define the rate. So so this would be the the, the rate, and then and then the effect is like what happens when that that point uh, takes place. Uh, 
so in this case, we we just adding one to to our to to our variable u to the accumulator, and then and then with the rate and with the fact we uh, we construct the jump. In this case, a constant rate jump, uh, and then uh, and then we define the parameters of the model. We define uh, the we and then we define and then we define uh, the type of problem we are solving. So in this case, a discrete problem because we we don't need to evolve time um, uh, in continuous steps. And then uh, and then with that we create the jump problem, and eventually we solve uh, using uh, the stepper that's provided by the jump process library. And I'll go in more detail after. But here I I, I inverted a little bit uh, the other there of uh, of events and then. Uh, I'd like to maybe first talk about the benchmarks, so you have an idea of like uh, how fast uh, the the library is and how it compares uh, with, with with other other containers. Uh, so for that, uh, we we contributed with uh, two new benchmarks. Uh, so one 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 of the benchmarks uh, the is a multivariate Hawkins process, and another is a synapse model. So the first uh, so the first one uh, that I, I mentioned is the Hawkins process. So, so you can think of it as a mutually exciting process. So your condition intensity has a base level, and and then you have, uh, and then you have that every time that an event happens, that um, either your event or an event for that that you're connected with, so that can influence your 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 own event, uh, that 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 will increase the intensity by by a rate alpha, and at the same time, like that uh, intensity will decrease. Uh, with an exponential rate uh, modulated by the term beta. So the further you go from the time that an event happened, like that, that the influence is going to go away. Like uh, you can you can implement this the, this rate uh, uh, like li like it is uh, in Julia, or or you can uh, implement a recursive approach because in this case uh, this also turns out to be a Markov Markov model because we can. Um, we can just look at the previous time and and then keep changing this this uh, the, this parameter phi, and then it, it, then you see that uh, it uh, that in this particular case uh, it makes a big difference for the simulation. So, but here I just want to illustrate that uh, with the current implementation you can implement any any type any of these two types and it would work just fine with the with the library, it, but of course with significant performance differences. Uh, and in here, you, how, that's how you do with Julia. Uh, you define the rate, uh, then you define the effect, uh, and then, you, as you see later, um, for the for the approach uh, that I'm uh, introduced, the coevolve, you you also need to define uh, the upper bound of the process, and then uh, and then the interval for which it's valid. But we go into more detail after. Uh, and so in this case, uh, the, this is how like maybe processes are connected with each other. So you have a graph, and then here you have the orange, the blue, and the green. The, these are displayed in panels A and B. Uh, and then here it just demonstrates um, it's a quantile plot to demonstrate that the, that we're simulating correctly. So ideally, they should be aligned with the exponential distribution, as in this case. So you can see that uh, when someone said that these spikes of like one event happens, and then they fade exponentially. Uh, and here uh, I compare then uh, with the different approaches. Um, so before the library could only solve this type of uh, problem with the direct approach, and, and then you see that. Uh, so here is a, no, is a network with ten nodes, but here I simulated for a hundred until a hundred nodes, and then before uh, we could only simulate uh, up to maybe twenty nodes. Then after that, the library uh, couldn't. Finish the simulation within the the time that allowed for the benchmarks, uh, and, and then uh, and the the same took place. Uh, maybe if I use another another library uh, called PDMP, uh, if I just use the brute force approach, it also not finish. Uh, in and then and then as I implemented the 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 Coevolve approach. Uh, you can see that uh, it significantly improved the performance. Uh, so, so if you use the brute force approach, which uh, you, you, you get uh, you, you get that it completes on time, but it's a bit slow. Uh, but then if you use a recursive implementation, um, and then it's uh, it's one of the fastest approaches. And then as it reaches the as it reaches a, a bigger and bigger network, uh, it starts to it starts to lose a little bit from the the 
PDMP approach using uh, the, 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 the derivative of the, of the model. Uh, and, and then this is because the approach that, that as we'll see later, use, uh, use uh, uh, the thinning process very aggressively. But in any case, uh, it's, uh, it's very competitive and, and then nice thing is very flexible. Uh, now, we, the, I also implemented another benchmark that uh, this was a response from a discourse thre uh, thread. Uh, so, so, so Roman Veltz, uh, he asked like, oh, can somebody try to, to, um, can somebody try to, how to run this model that I'm publishing like, and get better results? So, <laughs> so I accepted the challenge, but, but unfortunately I didn't, <laughs> I didn't manage to beat them. But uh, I, ha I generated many insights because, um, because like it, it was sort of it was, it was was quite straightforward to implement. Like there was a lot of like remapping of variable of one type of implementation to another. But but then what I found out is that like um, with the the current the approach uh, with my approach, uh, uh, you you end up like doing a lot of rejections as as you think the process. Uh, but you still can be quite competitive, and, and then and then as you develop better, uh, as in the future maybe we, we develop better rejection approach, so you can uh, potentially even match the performance of the other model. And then here is uh, these are benchmarks that were read in the library, and it just shows that the coevolve approach, uh, which is the the last one, remains competitive with the other ones. Um, and, and, and then in this case, the, the, jump pro, the, the jumps are constant. So, so then of course, like uh, Coevolve is designed for, for, variable, uh, for variable rates. So, so it, uh, it, it's not as fast and probably like needs some investigation, but, but it's still quite competitive. So very general. Uh, so here I'm gonna delve into how, how it how works a little bit and how, how jump process and differential equations are connected with each other. Um, and then, um, so, so basically jump process is like a, it's a fancy callback for uh, that uh, is provided. So differential equations allow you to provide callbacks and what jump process does is it, 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 it's a fancy callbacks for, for point process. So, so basically, uh, what a discrete callback needs is a, is a condition and effect, and, and that's exactly what we provide in the uh, what jump process provides in the library. So, so basically, uh, we overload the the, uh, the we overload the the callback uh, the aggregators. That's what uh, that's what here in the table you you see like this. There's many different types of aggregators. So so we we overload this uh, to have it uh, be uh, a rate and effect at the same time, and also an initializer. So, so when you provide an aggregator, uh, you basically like uh, we basically like uh, taking this uh, the aggregator that the name that you gave, and then and then calling the call uh, initializing the the structure for the callback. Um, and then and then here uh, usually we. We have the condition, so the condition, is, uh, so, the, so, so the condition for the callback is usually like before we reach that time, we just telling the we just telling the stepper, okay, you're gonna have to step at that exact time, uh, and then the most important part is actually the effect because uh, what because we know we, because once we stop at that time, we actually have to predict, we actually have to tell the stepper when they're gonna have to step next. So, so we're gonna say, okay, before you move on, uh, I'm gonna do some computation here, and then I'm gonna tell you when when's the next time you're gonna have to stop, and that's what the the effect here is uh, is doing. Um, so, 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 okay. So, but sometimes we don't need to actually to use like a continuous steppers because sometimes we're just interested in uh, in evolving like a jump only process. So, so the library also also supports uh, also provides uh, its own steppers. Uh, so, so, the, so the way differential equation uh, usually works is that is that it, you you you, you give a stepper and then it tells you, it tells the differential equations JL like how um, how it should step like uh, so so from time t1 to t2 like um, how big is the step and all of that. But uh, with jump process, uh, if you just want to do jumps, like you, you don't need 
to have like such a fine grain uh, stepper, like you can just tap to the next jump. And the way and, and the, the way it does that is by providing a custom stepper, which is called the which is a SSA stepper, and, and then and then basically it it it, it goes and uh, it goes and just steps uh, from from jump to jump to jump without having to do like all these small changes. So it can be very useful, like if you're just doing uh, if you're just uh, modeling like jumps. Um, and then, and then, yeah, and then of course, uh, because this is integrated into the differential equations library, uh, uh, jumps can also uh, provide uh, provide a way to uh, to to step uh, with continuous integrators. So this is what I'm illustrating here. So, so how so so the aggregator type so. So we have uh, three types of aggregators, as I mentioned before. Uh, so, so for th for the case of uh, the inverse method, like uh, there are no aggregators available because it, it, it requires the continuous stepper. But but for for the other for the other types, the thinning and the queuing, it uh, it can use uh, the 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 SSA stepper that we provide. Uh, and then basically, what what okay, uh, what you have to tell uh, jumpprocess.jl is. Uh, Okay, which aggregator I'm gonna use, and then uh, what type of jumps I'm gonna give you, and then additionally some aggregators like Coevolve also require a dependency graph. Uh, so there are two types of jumps. So either you have a constant rate jump. Uh, so this only requires that you provide the rates and then the effect. So the the effect here is not the same effect as in the callback effects that you might see in the differential equations OGL library, but it's, it's an effect like what happens to that, uh, what happens to your model when, when that, that, that jump happens. So in terms of the, the, the constant rate jump. Uh, and then also like for the variable rate jump, in addition to the rate and the effect, you, al you also have to provide the, if you wanna use the new aggregator, the coevolve aggregator, you need to provide the upper bound uh, you need to provide uh, the, the upper bound. So, so I will show you later what I mean by that. So, an upper bound for how long, for a ha how um, for the for upper bound for the, the rate. So, you, you can gar you have to guarantee that that, that rate is not going to be higher than than your upper bound throughout the interval that you also have to provide. So, the rate interval. So, so let's say your rate interval is a function that uh, that, that that says. Okay, until time 10, uh, my my rate is not going to be higher than 100. But this this can also I'll, I'll be these are functions that uh, you have to provide to the to the aggregator. And then L rate is uh, is a helper, so so you can provide that, but you can also choose not to provide. So if if you if you know that your your jump we always have a base base level. Uh, Rate so so it's a good idea to provide because that will ensure that I, I, that when you're thinning as I will show an illustration later that uh, you can reject it, it faster. Uh, okay so so the, so here's where I explain thinning. Uh, so basically what happens is like let's say you have um, so let's say you started at time zero and then you and then you have this uh, process and then you had two points that took that took place. And then now you're time t, so so you have like uh, you have like many processes happening at the same time. So one of the processes is the, the dotted line here, and, and then as you add all the process all the intensities together, you end up with a with a full line. And, and basically, what thinning does is that like we define a process that um, that that is this square square box here, and then and then we and then we sample from that uh, square box. That square box is is a process with constant rate, and and then we sample from that box, and then we get uh, we get a candidate point, so the gray one here, and then and then we have to decide oh should we accept or should we reject it, and then to do that uh, what we do is uh, we we sample from the uniform distribution, and then the bound and using the boundary as, uh, and using the boundary as the as the max. Uh, as the uh, as the maximum of the uniform distribution, and then if it falls below your your rate at that point in time, so at this point where the candidate is being evaluated, then we're gonna accept, and then uh, if it is above, then we reject, and 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 and, and then if if your candidate is uh, after L, so the, the 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 time of the interval, then then we reject it automatically, and then we move on. So this is how thinning works, 
so before that, uh, jump, jump process.jl used to only uh, only handle constant rates efficiently, and there's a lot of tricks you can use. So here I illustrate uh, some of the tricks that they are using here uh, to make the process more efficient. And then if you're using one type and another, it's using, dif it's I using different tricks. Um, and then with the, the co-evolve, like, um, I, I took a step back and then I went back to the tiny algorithm. And then my, my main idea was uh, well, to, to queue every, everything. Like, so you, you usually you define processes that are connected, but they are not like uh, densely connected. They're just sparsely connected with each other. And, and, then, and, then, uh, and then the key difference is that now uh, we can think together with the, pro with the OD. So, 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 the, so if you, you want to incorporate the jump process with an OD, now we're stepping at the same uh, together with the, with the model. And, and then it, it, it becomes more efficient and more compatible. Uh, so, so that's it. Uh, thank you uh, very much for for coming. Uh, here, are some uh, some some suggestions for way forward. Uh, so, if anybody wants to contribute to the library, maybe in you you wanna you want somewhere to start. Here, some suggestions, and and I hope that you use the library and let, leave comments, issues if you have any problem. Happy to address. <laughs> thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? A lot of the distributions, oh, I'm over here. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Um, are in uh, distributions.jl, defines a lot of distributions. And separate from the distributions, it has samplers that you can sort of use specialized samplers that do rejection methods. Were any of those useful in this? Is that architecture useful for writing something like this? Uh, yeah, so so distribution JGL, I think like it, it it's useful for like sampling from distributions, but but when you have a, a process, so it's like you want to sample a, a random function, like so in that case, like uh, in the case of point process, you want to sample a random measure. So then it's a bit more difficult than uh, to describe that 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 the function you want to sample because the space of like measures in this case of a point process is too big. It's like you cannot describe it like I guess algorithmically. Uh, maybe you could, I don't know. Uh, but but then then you you have to then uh, to, to, to then it was not possible. Like the short answer, maybe it's possible if you have wrappers, uh, and then that, that's where then I I came to 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 this uh, approach to use uh, jump process the jail. So I just wanted to say thank you because I, I use gem processes in my research and I ran into like exactly this problem of like I wanted to handle time dependent rates and I saw like your method was merged in like one month prior so it's like a great feeling. I can just switch it out. So. That's great. That's a great feeling for me as well. <laughs> okay. So let's all thank our speaker again. And we have a quick announcement before the next talk. Uh, just a quick logistical announcement. Uh, the poster session is happening at 6 p.m. Uh, right over here, right behind us in the, in the fourth floor corridor. Um, there will be appetizers. Uh, so please join us for that. 6 p.m. just in this corridor over here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> OK, so our next speaker is uh, Michael Tiller. Uh, he's the president of the North American Modelica User Group. Um, he's the author of at least one Modelica book. I guess it's two. I even use it for my own lectures. Um, and he's a developer of the Modelica language. And Michael will tell us a little bit about the next generation uh, or thoughts for the next generation of Julia. Uh, the stage is yours. Thanks. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to tell you about the next generation. I'm just assuming you are the next generation. I'm just going to tell you what I think. Um, OK, so um, as, as Lars said, my name is Michael Tiller. Thank you all for, uh, for coming. Um, so a little bit about who I am. Uh, so I'll. Try and be quick here. So I, uh, I started my career at Ford Motor Company working on powertrain research. 
And uh, I worked on one of the, uh, I'm, I'm not one of, the original uh, Ford Hybrid Escape. So for those of you who don't know, the Ford Hybrid Escape was the first production hybrid in North America. Um, it was second only in the world to the Prius, which was produced in Japan, obviously. It was the first hybrid SUV. So it was a lot of fun, uh, and I used Medelica a lot on that project. Um, in the meantime, I've done various things. I've been a consultant and an entrepreneur for various companies. You can see listed there. Uh, I'm currently the CTO at a company called Realis Simulation, which used to be a, a business unit inside of Ricardo, for anybody who knows who Ricardo is. Um, I'm the author of two books on physical modeling, and uh, I programmed in pretty much every language from 6502 assembly to Zig uh, over my career. So I'm, I, even though a lot of my work is in engineering, uh, I've always just been really passionate about, about software engineering. So I should say, since most of my career has been in mechanical engineering, but I've, I've been passionate pretty much my whole life about software engineering. Uh, I noticed looking at the, 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 the people in this audience and the people at this conference, there's a little bit of a generational gap between me and most of you. I, so I, I, you know, my observations are that you know, the average Julia user probably has their first computer is probably an Apple MacBook, and their first ID might have been you know, VS Code. First scientific language may very well be Julia. Uh, when you think of assembly language, you probably think of something like LLVM, and uh, a popular song from your youth would be something like Fast Car. So for me, first computer was an Apple IIe. Um, for, uh, my first IDE was punch cards, probably. Um, my first scientific language was in Fortran. And uh, when I think of assembly language, I think of 6502 assembly. But interestingly, we have this in common. There was a popular song in my youth, also called Fast Car. So, um, okay, so, so I'm just acknowledging this sort of generational gap, right? Which, because I know what all of you are thinking. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to, 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 sell, to tell you something you think is of, of value here. Uh, in fact, I'm reminded of this, this scene from Real Genius, if you haven't seen it. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it here. No, you can't hear it because my, my sound's off. Anyway, I'll skip that, I'll skip that. But anyway, okay, so, um, just a, a couple quick words about Medelica. Um, as was mentioned, I, I'm a member of the Medelica Design Group. I've been involved in Medelica since about 1999. Uh, I'm this, currently the secretary of the Medelica Association. I'm the president of the North American Medelica Users Group. I'm the creator of the Medelica Playground. Um, I'll quickly show what that is. I'm the author of two books. One is Introduction to Physical Modeling with Medelica, which is only available in a sort of dead tree format. But uh, Medelica, by example, is, um, is available online. And so I can just sort of quickly show you a couple of things here. So uh, it's not, okay. So Medelica by example, as, as I mentioned, is an online book. You can find it pretty easily. Um, it features um, some interactivity. So if you, all the examples in the book, you can, you can simulate um, in, online. So you can change values and play around with them and re-simulate them and so on. So, uh, and then Medelica Playground is a place where you can uh, create Medelica models. This is a sort of classic model in Medelica of a bouncing ball and how you would model that and then you can Simulate it, and it will. It allows you to generate reports that include things like animation, so you can see things like the bouncing ball and the plot of the trajectory of the bouncing ball. So um, anyway, so I'm I'm the creator of those as well. Um, let me let me pause this so it doesn't slow my computer down while I'm doing this presentation. So um, okay, this is a just a quick taste of Medelica uh, for people who haven't seen it before. So you have the ability to define connectors here. The connector has a voltage and a current associated with it. Then you can uh, create components like a resistor that have these electrical connectors on them, P and N, and then you can, you can write out equations associated with the resistor, most specifically Ohm's law and the conservation of current. And then you can combine those components into uh, essentially system models. So you can have you know, an RLC circuit here uh, you connect things up, and you can, you can compose these into very deep hierarchies. So you can start with a car that's composed of an engine, a transmission, and a drive line, and then the transmission might be composed of gears, and it might have a hydraulic com aspect, which has valves, and you know, all the way down. So I've, I've uh, even way back in, when I first started working with Medelica, we managed to create a model that had about a quarter of a million equations in it using this kind of compositional technique, building up uh, complex models from hierarchies. But I just wanted to give you a sense of, of the flavor of the language. It's a declarative language. It's not a, a, an imperative language is a, a key uh, thing about it. So you're thinking Medelica, Medelica, Medelica. You know, wait, 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 this is JuliaCon, right? So why is this guy going on and on about Medelica? By the way, does anybody know what this meme is in reference to? All right, very good. All right, excellent. We're all the same generation. Okay, so. Um, okay, so uh, this is not a talk about Medelica, but I just feel like I have to give some context here. So the first thing is I come in peace. So one of the reviewers uh, to my talk 
uh, made this comment like, okay, he seems like he's, you know, he, he said he seems like he's coming in peace. So, okay, yes, I am. I, I'm, I'm not here to, to criticize or to, to try and convert you to Medellica. That's not the purpose here. Um, I, I will say that, I mean, out of respect to a lot of my colleagues in the Medellica community, Medellica is a very solid, very stable technology. But the, the thing I'm asking myself is really what comes next after that, right? I mean, it's stabilized. So, I mean, it's good. It's good at what it does. But the thing is, you know, innovation being what it is, something's going to come along and disrupt it, right? So, the thing I want you to understand is I want you to innovate. I want you to disrupt, all right? I, I want to see the modeling and simulation space uh, improving and more new technologies and more capabilities, okay? So, that is, is part of my motive here. But the thing I will say is the Medellica Design Group was full of some really, really smart people, and they gave a lot of thought to what's going into Medellica. And I just want to make sure that the next generation of people uh, look at it and understand that there, there's a lot of, of value in there. In fact, um, you know, we spend a lot of time on these detailed discussions. Um, it's hard to know what's going to be important and what isn't. But Medellica has you know 25 years under its belt, and I think we've we figured out what you know what what was uh, what was important. Uh, in those 25 years. But, you know, sometimes we guessed wrong, sometimes um, we guessed right. But that's also hard-won knowledge that, you know, the next generation can, can take advantage of. And, uh, and, you know, in some cases we, 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 we sort of guessed right, but then, you know, technology changed out from underneath us. I'll talk a little bit about that. So, um, it, I, the other thing I'll point out about Medellica is that there's an extensive standard library across many, many domains. And, uh, there's a lot of content, a lot of, again, hard-won knowledge in there, uh, and just be aware of it. It exists. There's no reason you can't learn from that directly. So, okay, so back to the Julia community, right? So, so also full of very smart people, okay, um, and um, doing some really amazing work in the area of modeling and simulation. I've, I've, I'm very excited about what's actually going on in the Julia community. So there's been, in fact, even uh, several notable cross collaborations between the Medellica community and the Julia community. Uh, Modia is this effort by Hilding Ungfist and Martin Otter, who were two of the, you know, main people in the Medellica um, effort. Uh, there's modeling toolkit by by Chris, um, and uh, you know, he ha there's some mixing of Medellica ideas in there. What's that? Yingbo, yes, and Yingbo. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, there's openmedelica.jl, uh, which is an, a, a, a sort of a col collaboration between the Open Medelica group to work in Julia. Um, and, you know, of course, you're going to be trying to figure out what's important and what isn't important, just like we were. So, uh, you know, you certainly should try and, you know, follow whatever your, uh, your intuitions are, but I'm just trying to give you a, a way of maybe avoiding rehashing things that I think are, are pretty clear cut that we, we had to go through as well. So uh, I'm going to go through a couple things here, you know, things I've, I've learned along the way. So one thing I noticed, I, I mentioned I work for Ford, and it's been very frustrating for me through my engineering career because I've always faced, and when I use the term engineer in this context, I'm going to be talking about like mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and so on, okay? I, it's a little ambiguous, but that's just my, my habit. So. Dealing with engineers in, in those kinds of industrial settings, they, they have a, a, a difference of opinion about this. They, they think that what they're doing, this modeling effort that they're doing, is not really like software development. And, and I, it, this is something that just gets under, that kind of annoys me. Because the thing is, from my perspective, modeling is really just a special kind of software development. And what I mean by that is that modeling benefits from having version control. It, it benefits from CI CD processes. It benefits from artifact management. It benefits from unit and integration testing, and it, it, it benefits from having a, a, a good, fast software development life cycle. Instead, in the, in the engineering world, they, they want to have their own tools to do basically these exact same things. And, and I just don't see why, you know, these are all solved problems. We should just move on from that. Just use the tools that are available. Use Git and use GitHub and use all these other tools, right? So that's just one thing to be aware of if you ever have to interact with engineers in an industrial setting. Um, at the end of the day, simulations are just functions. Um, you, you know, they have inputs, they have outputs, and uh, you know, they should, one of the things that I find is that they need to be callable from other tools. It's not just enough to be able to just run a simulation because you have to, you have to integrate the simulations into the product development process. And that means that they might become part of some larger process. In fact, they're almost certain to become part of a larger process because nobody just runs one simulation. I always say simulations are like Doritos. You know, nobody just has one. Right? You, you have to run it multiple times to get anything of value out of it. 
And, and so that just reiterates the idea that it's a function that you might want to build up higher order processes on top of that, which are themselves functions, uh, in order to do your analysis. And I'll point out technologies like FMI and EFMI, which if you're not familiar with them, that's not the topic of this talk, but these are things that came out of the Medellica Association to make it so that simulations could effectively be embedded in other things, to treat them as, as functions for the most part. So, uh, and those, those standards caught on you know, very quickly, uh, which just indicates the, the pent up demand for, for that kind of functionality. Um, another thing I, I'm, you know, I commonly point out is that there's this sort of, in terms of the need for models, there's a sort of continuum in most businesses. You know, there are some people in the industry who have an amazing grasp of the physics of the systems that they're working with. They understand these hydraulic valves and how friction works and wet clutches and dry clutches. They, they understand all that stuff. Um, now when I say, uh, but the thing is, you, so the first thing is you gotta give them a way to capture all that knowledge, you know, what they understand about that. Give it, not just a way to capture it, but ideally to help take the value that, that, that's represented by their knowledge and, and deliver it to the rest of the organization so that they're not just the gatekeeper who answer, or the oracle who answers questions about this, but they can, they can take that information and, and deploy it out to the rest of their organization. But also when I say some, I really mean very few. Um, there, there, there are some, this is true, but th there just aren't nearly enough in most cases. And so you have to keep that in mind. They represent sort of the, the top of this pyramid, all right, at where the rest of the company is underneath it. And um, so since most people do not have an amazing grasp of physics in these organizations, we need to find a way to reach them. And so that means things like low slash no code solutions developing graphical modeling environments, developing turnkey applications where you just, the, a, a, what I would call a casual user, or maybe a, you know, just, yeah, that's probably the best term, uh, just enters data or makes a few choices and then pushes a button and gets the results, all right? And, and so it's important to have tooling that gets, gets to that point, not, not just that, that the, the genius engineer can use, but that everybody in, in the company is, is getting value from that. And, Another thing that I found interesting in the process of developing Medellica was this notion of specifications versus implementations. And what I mean by that is Medellica took a specification-based approach to what they did. What that means is that there were efforts like VHDL, AMS, and so on that were attempting to develop specifications that would be published and then multiple tool vendors would implement them. And, and that's the approach that Medellica took as well. Um, and I'm... Not so sure that's the best idea. The, a good analogy in the modern day, I would say there's two here, are things like uh, browsers. Now browsers tried to take a specification-based approach, and I mean, they, technically they did take a specification-based approach, and then they quickly aggregated into basically two. Uh, and um, you know, so the idea that you can have multiple teams putting in this enormous amount of engineering effort to implement exactly the same functionality, it doesn't scale very well. Uh, it, ultimately, people will, join forces and, and may ultimately end up with you know, just one in the end, depending on how, how long uh, Mozilla can hold out in this. Um, but anyway, uh, Python's kind of the counter example, right? Python is, there's, there's no specification, there's just an implementation, there's, there's just Python, right? You can make C Python and you can make you know, PyPy and you can make other variations of Python and whatever, but, but really there's just one implementation and everybody else is using that implementation as a specification. And um, like I said, Medellica took the, the approach of doing the specification-based stuff. I, I'm, I'm leaning much more now in my, my later years in, the, in this sort of standard versus slash reference implementation kind of approach. Um, I just think it's a better allocation of resources. Um, a couple of miscellaneous things to, to keep in mind. So, you know, in an industrial setting, the results matter far more than the technology you use to accomplish them. I, I, I love technology, so this is something that kind of breaks my heart, but it's really true. Yeah, and so you just have to always keep that in mind. Uh, if you want to sway people, it's not going to be by, you know, you know, I, I can't imagine going to one of my managers at Ford and, and raving about just-in-time compilation. I mean, he just he wouldn't care or know what he was talking about. So, um, so that's one thing. Um, the, one of the things that I found very where I was most successful, I would say, is um, it, I'll use the Ford Hybrid Escape as an example. So Ford at the time had a lot of engine and transmission analysis capabilities. They'd been making cars, obviously, for a long time. And the thing was, though, that the, all of the efforts that they had to analyze powertrains were to 
validate against dynamometer data. You probably don't even know what a dynamometer is, but it's this thing that you stick the engine on, you palletize the engine, you stick it on there, and you run it at a at sort of constant speed all the time. And then you look at, you measure things like the brake-specific fuel consumption and other and, and, and torque and whatnot. And then you wanted the models to basically be simulations of those dynamometers, because that's what the data was. You had dynamometer data, so in your simulation, you had to simulate the system like it was on a dynamometer. And where this sort of, the comical effect of this is that when the first hybrids came out, uh, hybrid vehicles, one of the things that they do, unlike conventional vehicles, is they shut off all the time. The engine shuts off and turns on, shuts off and turns on. So whereas a conventional vehicle is just idling, right, and that's an important point when you try and figure out the overall fuel economy of a car, uh, the hybrids don't. They shut, they shut down and they turn on. And so it turns out that one of the things, there were a bunch of issues, but one of them that I worked on uh, was, was how do you minimize the, 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 essentially the vibrations when the engine starts and stops. And none of the analysis tools we had could do that because they were all used to just running the engine at a normal steady operating condition. They had nothing in them for modeling the dynamics of starting and stopping the engine. Well, it just wasn't something that they cared about. They never did any tests like that. And so this formed a vacuum in terms of Ford's analysis capabilities and it was easy for us to step into that vacuum, right? They would take anything to, because they, I mean, they had nothing, right? So, so even if you're, this is just a nascent technology, you can get in the door there as opposed to being in a situation where you have a whole bunch of entrenched players and you're trying to, you're trying to displace them, that's much harder. So one, one suggestion I would have for anybody who's trying to advance any new technology, Julia or otherwise, is to try and find where those vacuums are. Try and look at how, the, how innovation is changing that landscape of capabilities and then find where, there's, where you can sort of anticipate there's gonna be a, a void, you know, where something's gonna be missing and then try and fill that void. Um, you know, the, the, on the modeling side, you know, it's nice to solve differential equations, but at the end of the day, because of that sort of pyramid I showed you before, most people, uh, they, don't, they don't have the, the knowledge of the physics to build up uh, component libraries that do a good job of accurately reproducing the physical response of systems. So if you can create the content for them, they'll, that's, a, that's a big selling point. Um, you know, transferring that, you know, basically uh, codifying your knowledge of something into some something you can hand off to them is, is really the way to go. Um, and also, one of the things we, we did in Medelica, at least, was we handled this notion of uh, refactoring. Let's say you, you make a model and you, you give it to a customer, and then you decide, well, you know what, I'm gonna refactor this model, I'm gonna change the name of this parameter, or I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add a new parameter, or I'm gonna move it to a different part, of, you know, give it a different name, something like that. You want the, the uh, end user to be able to easily upgrade their, um, their system to use those. And so we would actually include in our models these refactorings as a some sort of symbolically or declaratively saying, oh, from version 3.13 to 3.14, this model changes name to this, or this parameter changes name to this. You know, so, so that you could, these are often called code mods in the JavaScript world, so that you could actually update downstream code uh, from those changes. So that's just another thing to keep in mind that, that Medelica did. And you know, you see this, like I said, in the JavaScript world. I'm not sure what, what, it does, what happens in Julia. Um, in terms of machine learning, obviously machine learning is a big topic right now. But a couple of things that you know, I, I tend to think about when it comes to machine learning. The one is, is something that Chris you know, talked about in his talks earlier today, which is that you know, if you can use a first principles model, you, that's, that's really nice. You know, that's the model side of his little beaker with the model and the data. If you can put some model in there, put some model in there. Uh, there's no sense in, in trying to figure that out from empirical data if you have the, if you know what the structure should be. Um, you know, at the end of the day, neural networks are just regressions. And so, um, you know, just, just try and keep that in mind. They're not pixie dust. They don't like, they're not magic properties from alien civilizations. Um, and um, the thing, another thing to keep in mind about simulation data that, and, and how it meets machine learning and AI that I try and point out to people is that if you think about something like credit card transactions, you know, you, you've got, if you take a terabyte of credit card transactions, what you're gonna have is about 100 billion credit card transactions with, with a, a few columns of data. And, and, and you can infer patterns from that kind of data a lot easier than you can from a one terabyte of simulation data because it might be a CFD run, it might be one simulation, it might be one case. So there's, n there's no way to sort of infer a pattern from, from one data point. So I, the way I usually refer to this is that it has a different aspect ratio. You know, it has, it's heavily weighted on columns and, and versus rows uh, as opposed to the other way around. And so when we think about applying AI and machine learning to simulation, we just have to kind of keep that in mind. Time series data is a little different because it is kind of moving forward in time, so that, that's, that's kind of like rows in, in, in this thing, but 
anyway, just something to keep in mind because I know everybody's got a lot of enthusiasm for these kinds of techniques, but um, the, you know, credit card transactions are not, are not simulations. A couple of things have changed in, in this time that are worth noting. I mean, graphics, uh, I would encourage you to be like Medellica in one regard, which is that in Medellica, we captured the, the, all the graphics associated with the model in the model itself. It moved with the model. It didn't reference some third, some file somewhere that could, you know, where you could have a dead link to the file. Everything, everything including the documentation, all sort of was embedded in the model. But don't be like Medellica. Don't invent your own vector graphics representation, which is what Medellica did. Um, at the time, we knew about SVG, but it wasn't that well supported. And so uh, everybody was kind of worried about adopting it and then having it sort of not be well supported. But now it's widely supported. And um, we, we did lots of things in Medellica to do dynamic uh, diagram rendering and uh, stuff like that. You can do that just as well in SVG if you, think, if you give it some thought. Um, another t uh, topic is uh, target architectures. So I'm big on the web, as you saw from my two examples I showed you before. Uh, I would say don't be like Python. Don't, don't relegate yourself to the server side. If you c there are lots of interesting possibilities to target things like WASM or um, JavaScript or something uh, so that you can get into the browser as opposed to being removed from the browser. And on that, along those same lines, uh, FMI is another example of a, of a target that you might want for interoperability with other systems. Uh, for embedded systems, you have EFMI or hardware in the loop systems. Um, and uh, ideally, you know, these kinds of things where you have a runtime free option so you don't have to install Julia in order to use the, the analysis code. And then there's all kinds of really interesting things going on with containers and serverless and beyond. A lot of it based on WebAssembly. Things like uh, Cloudflare has some really cool uh, worker things that are based on WebAssembly. I just, it, uh, I call these to your attention just because they're, they're real opportunities to be using Julia and you don't want to lock yourself out of them. Okay, so why Julia? So I see uh, several opportunities with Julia. One is this fantastic ecosystems that you, that you guys have built and the foundation, it's a really great foundation for modeling and simulation. Um, modeling toolkit, you know, for higher level modeling, you know, just getting above the differential equations and actually being able to compose models in a more declarative way kind of toward the Medellica effort. Um, the one thing I'm really excited about is this idea that you can have more modular tool chains. In Medellica, most of the tools are monolithic. It's GUI all the way down to, to, to simulation. There's no point of being able to substitute pieces or being able to branch off. And so the idea that you could have sort of separate GUIs, models, symbolics, targets, simulations, I think that's really uh, interesting. Um, and uh, Chris mentioned earlier today ideas about leveraging symbolic transformations for looking at stochastic processes and all, all kinds of other things. That's also pretty interesting, kind of related to that previous point. There are some what I would call risks and opportunities. Uh, they can be opportunities if you, if you make them opportunities, but they're risks, I think, if you ignore them. Um, and so uh, this sort of Turing completeness of a language is, is a double-edged sword. Modelica doesn't let you do anything. It's not quite a Turing complete language, and, and that's deliberate to, res to make it so that the symbolic manipulation doesn't get tied up in knots. Um, so sort of use Turing complete constructs at your peril, I guess, is, is the thing there. Debugging acausal models because they have simultaneous systems of equations is quite hard. And so think about that. Think about how you're going to do that because if you, if you go down the same route that Medellica did and you don't think about that, then that's going to be what everybody complains about in, for your modeling capabilities. Um, Low-level error messages for high-level errors are really unhelpful. So if you end up with something that just says, oh, this is a singular Jacobian, people are like, okay, all right, well, where, what do I do with that? So, so you know, think about how you can, you can percolate those errors back up to where they originated and, ta you know, localize them to where they originated. Um, different domains may require different user interfaces or different file formats. Uh, I think the Neuroblocks one talked about making a DSL. Uh, maybe, maybe. I, I mean, that, that's something to definitely consider. Um, and I think static typing is important. In Medellica, we have this replaceable construct that's very, very useful. Uh, for making sure that things are physically compatible, and I, I wouldn't want to give that up. Um, anyway, okay, so in conclusion, uh, I'm super excited to see what the developers in the Julia community come up with. There are a lot of good ideas out there, a lot of really interesting use cases um, that, that came out of the Medellica effort, and so you might want to try and incorporate some of those. Hopefully, you know, you can feel free to read my book about Medellica, if only to try and extract some, some of the good ideas out of there. Uh, lots of opportunities uh, for the Julia community, and uh, with that, I will open it up for questions. Did I do it, Lars? I think I was right on the right on the dot. I think. Right. Okay, Brad.
probably can do it here. Yeah, I, 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 that's part of my warning is that I'm not sure we came up with a great way of doing that. I mean, it's, it really comes down to in the acausal systems, people who come from Simulink are used to causal models and they're used to being able to step through and see where the data got corrupted. But when you have a simultaneous system, everything changes all at once and it's all wrong. And so you, you, you can't figure out the causality of that. So th there are some ideas around that um, that the Open Modelica people looked at for debugging. I, I would investigate that, but it, it's challenging. It's, it's, it's a tricky thing, especially if somebody comes from the simulating background because they're used to think it, it's very imperative in that case and it's very easy to trace where the stuff comes from. So Chris, yeah. What is the one feature or domain that Modelica did not do that it should have? Is it, you know, jump, stochasticity, or is it more like, you know, a domain, like it should have gone into chemical reactions more? Or, you know, like what is, what is like the one thing that's like, oh, I really wish it did that? Well, I mean, uh, one, uh, one answer would be something like PDEs. It didn't bring that sort of expressiveness to the PDE world. I'm not, I don't know what the demand is in the PDE world, but uh, that was my, my PhD work was actually in something very similar. Uh, so that, w that would be one answer. I'd say that we pushed uh, fluid modeling pretty far in the Modelic space, but I think that the, the future of that endeavor is still up in the air. I think there's still plenty of room for improvement there. Um, so that's the, the, the multi-body systems and, and fluid systems, especially two-phase or multi-phase fluid systems, are really tricky uh, to, to, to do in terms of user interface, in terms of diagnostics. Uh, in terms of just numerics and initialization. So the, everything, you know, you know, electric circuits and stuff, that's not, that's pretty well established. And even just simple mechanical systems are pretty straightforward. But the, those are the two frontiers where I feel like it always gets kind of dicey. So. I, I can comment on that. Um, whether the thermal stuff, you, you even have companies that only work on thermal modeling in Modelica. Yeah. Um, therefore, it's hard to tackle that field from, from my point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, anyway, it's but, so. But, but that's due to business reasons, not due to technical reasons. Yeah. I, mean, one I answer, agree with you on technical reasons. Yeah. One answer, Chris, I, I did something, uh, I did a paper once on economic modeling, you know, modeling sort of supply and demand kinds of things. Uh, that, that was pretty challenging to do in Medellica. Uh, not, not because of the math, but because just the way the user interfaces and the GUIs and stuff are set up, it just didn't, wasn't really well suited. So. A last quick question. Thanks for very insightful presentation. So just to tease a little bit, do, what, what do you think the open source can bring to Julia that they didn't bring to Modelica? Well, I mean, just to be clear, Modelica's specification is open source, it's standard library is open source, and there's an open source implementation of Modelica called Open Modelica. So I, it's not that there's any lack of open source in the Modelica community. I, I think uh, I would say that what Julia potentially could have as an advantage is taking the more Pythonic sort of approach in that you have essentially a standard implementation of say, for example, modeling toolkit or something like that that everybody builds on instead of every company who wants to be involved in this space has to build their own. You know, they can just build on top of that and provide content on top of that, you know, model libraries on top of that potentially. Um, so that's, that's where I think the open source part would, would be the biggest advantage is just having a single starting implementation. Okay, okay so let's thank our speaker again. And our next speaker is Gaurav Aria. Is that pronounced correctly? <laughs> okay, he's a student at MIT. And uh, Gaurav will talk about stochastic ID.jl, differentiating discrete randomness. Yeah.